Welcome to a meeting of the Boston Region MPO. I'm David Moeller. I represent, Sec I represent Secretary Monica Tibbetts Nutt here. Um, David, please call the roll. Absolutely. I will read the notice of non discrimination very quickly. You are welcome to participate in our planning process regardless of your race, color, national origin, including limited English proficiency, religion, disability, age, gender, identity, or background. You may also read the full notice of your rights on our Boston MPO website. Uh, if we progress to the next and the next slide, this meeting is being recorded and it's accessible to people with disabilities, including Zoom. If you require additional accommodations to participate fully, please hey, contact Aaron McGuire uh, via the yeah. chat box at emcguire at cdps.org or 857-702-3681. With that, I will read the roll. Uh, the roll starts with mass.seat1. This is David Moeller. I'm here. Mass.seat2. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan Gulliver. Mass.seat2. Thank no. you. Yeah, they'd have to, yeah, no, 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 that's, they'd have to do it. The whole process is different. I will continue. Yeah, Mass. they have to start over. Anyway, division. Yeah, I'm not sure if um, they'd probably. Could you mute, please, if you're online? Thank you. Keep going, David. Thank you. Uh, Mass. Dot Highway Division. Mass. Dot John Romano, Mass. Dot Highway here. Uh, MBTA. Sandy Johnson, MVTA, representing General Manager Phil Eng. Massport. Sarah Lee here. MAPC. Mark Grayson here. MBTA Advisory Board. Brian K here. Advisory Council. Andy Reeker uh, for the Advisory Council. City of Boston, seat one. City of Boston, seat two. Uh, Jed Rowe. Uh, seat two. Next is at large city city of Everett. Eric Molinari representing Mayor Carlo Di Maria in the city of Everett. At large city city of Newton. Ruth Van Puller, Mayor, city of Newton. At large town, town of Arlington. <laughs> John Alessi representing um, select board chair Steve DeCourcy in the town of Arlington. At large town, town of Brookline. Intercore Committee, City of Somerville. Katiana Ballantyne, Mayor of Somerville, present. Uh, Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, Town of Acton, please. Uh, next, Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Uh, Dennis Giambetti, representing Metro West, and uh, Mayor Charles Zizki. North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Darlene Wynn, representing Mayor Michael Cahill in the City of Beverly for the North Shore Task Force. North Suburban Planning Council, Town of Burlington. South Shore Coalition, Town of Hull. Erwin Nessoff, Chair Hull Select Board, representing South Shore. Oh, representing Hull, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Rentham. Uh, and Three Rivers Interlocal Council, Town of Norwood. Steve Olinoff representing uh, the Three Rivers Interlocal Council, Town of Norwood. I'm next gonna call Federal Highway Administration. Joy Singh, Division Administrator for the State of Massachusetts, Federal Highway Administration. Federal Transit Administration. Good morning, Pete Butler, FDA. Good morning, and with that, that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, David. Uh, before we get to the secretary, I wanted to let everybody know that we're slightly changing the agenda. Both the secretary and the administrator have to be in Worcester later. So we're going to move the administrator up to after the secretary's remarks. And we, uh, one other thing, so for anybody in the public who wants to speak, we have moved public comment down to item number seven. Um, we will be calling on you. Please don't worry about it. Secretary. Morning, everyone. And I will apologize, I do have to leave. We have our employee performance recognition today. So if there was anything else, I would 100% not leave, <laughs> but this one's really important. Um, so I just wanna say it is good to see everyone and especially to see everyone in person. This is a really interesting time 
here at MassDOT. And I think the amount of projects we're doing right now, and I think the scale of the projects we're doing right now has put us in a really interesting position. Many of the communities, and I think this is something the governor talks a lot about, regional equity is a really big deal. And the amount of time that I spend out in the communities, and I do mean all of the communities, all the way out to Western Mass, all the way down to the South Shore, the big thing that continuously comes up is regional equity. And the other big thing is, listen, we are making investments in housing, we need better transportation. And so when we talk about programs like the regional transit authorities and we talk about the funding that has been given to them, whether you're talking about the $30 million for fare free, whether you're talking about the continued investments to help them expand their services, I think it really shows that when you make thoughtful investments and when you make investments to ensure that independent of where you live in Massachusetts that you are going to have those options, it makes a really big deal in people's lives. We've been doing these stakeholder events throughout our districts, throughout Massachusetts, and this is an opportunity for us to leave 10 Park Plaza. We take all of the administrators out, we take the registrar out, and we give an opportunity for the public to come talk to us. We have an opportunity for municipal staff to come out, for the elected officials, and they're constantly packed. And the big thing that we always start out with is, you know, Let's just introduce all of us, let's talk about some of the things we're doing, and then we open it up to the public. And the big thing that we say is, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you're all here. <laughs> and it is consistent, every single time, that's what they open with, like, oh my gosh, no one ever comes out here. We can't believe you all came out here. And I think that is really emblematic of how difficult it has been for a lot of the communities throughout the years. And the other big thing we talk about is chapter 90. You all know about that life. I'm looking around the room. You know all about that and how difficult it can be for a lot of the communities, especially the smaller communities, the more rural communities, the communities that are really focused on environmental justice. It can be really difficult for them. And having a lieutenant governor that is a former mayor, I think makes this a much different conversation and I think really shows how much this administration cares about this and the amount of time that they're putting in and trying to make this easier. The other thing is using more technology to make this easier, more approachable, whether you're talking about Grant Central, whether you're talking about more integrated AI to just make everything easier for people to get these funds. These funds are not only vital to the municipalities, but I think also really talks about the intersection of economic development and housing. I constantly say, and I'm sure many of you heard me say, housing has a transportation problem and transportation has a housing problem. I think with the housing bond bill, I think we are finally starting to address this, but it is going to take time. And so I think for us, in the meantime, it really is looking at land use, looking at what we can do, partnering with all of you to make it easier for people to build housing. And not just affordable housing. We spend a lot of time talking about affordable housing. It's not gonna be enough. We need a full spectrum of housing. We have to give people options. People are suffering in Massachusetts. It is incredibly expensive to live here. Young people are leaving. You know, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce did that unbelievable um, study and that's the big thing that came out. We have unbelievable educational institutions and students that can't stay. And I think for any of us that have kids, if things continue, there's no way our kids can afford to live here. And it really is up to us as the state government, I think it's up to all of you to try and get innovative and try and find a way for us to do this. The funding is always gonna be difficult, land use is always gonna be difficult, but if, if nothing else, this room can actually make a difference on that. But it is going to require us to do things that we do not normally do. We are a very unique state in that we don't have county governments, and I think that makes it very difficult to do a lot of the planning work we do here, but we can't use that as, a, as an excuse because I think we know how to do these things. I think the other thing is going into next year, this is going to be a very different administration at the federal level. It's administration that 
we don't know who's going to be stepping into these seats. And I think any time you have a change in presidential administration, you don't know who the secretaries are going to be. You don't know who is going to be making a lot of these larger scale decisions. It makes the public very nervous. And that's independent of any administration. It makes the public very nervous. And so I think right now, for us, it's really important to reassure them that our priorities aren't going to change. They aren't. And I think it really, once again, goes back to the quality of life. So as we get through this meeting, I think as we continue to talk about these projects, it is really important to remember who we do this for and why we do it. So I think the other thing I would ask all of you is we have to continue these conversations. We have to continue to talk about housing. We have to continue to talk about building housing in the places that we have transit and then finding a way to build transit in the places that we have housing. I know all of you think about this, but we really need to do better and we need to do more. And that does start with DOT. It starts with the MPO, but it really comes down to the elected officials. And so for me, I'm just asking, please help us. Ask us for what you need, because we are going to be here independent of what the next year is going to look like, we are going to be here. So this is kind of one of those larger scale remarks here, because I have a lot of really good remarks about very specific things, but the thing is you all know about them. I don't need to tell you about the projects, but it is really for me, this is just a message that I need you all to hear. I really do. So please let us know what we can do but also please start doing different things and we will make sure that the investments are going to those places. That's it, that's all I've got. Thank you, Secretary. I'll, I'll take your remarks that you didn't use. <laughs> Jonathan. All right, thanks, David. I, I believe I have a presentation, but I can talk through it if it's not. We're going to, do we have it up? Just come up. All right, well, while, while they're pulling this up, I, I am, uh, again, for those of you who don't know me, and I know, I know many of you in the room, and it's good to see you all. Uh, I'm Jonathan Gulliver. I'm the State Highway Administrator. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about what our capital program, what some of the accomplishments we've made in this past year, and uh, where we're going to be going and how we're going to be managing it. Uh, the, uh, why, don't we, why don't we go to the next slide, because I think this really tells the story of some of the challenges right away. So uh, for those of you who, I know everybody's familiar with what the highway division does and, and some of the work that we are responsible for, but I, I like showing people these, these figures because it, it's so, uh, evident how big of a program we actually have and how, how uh, you know, I, I like to think of it as a, that we, we basically touch every part of Massachusetts in one way, shape, or form, whether it's through it's our, our bridge program, our uh, highway program, our roads program, or, or our municipal grants. Uh, we, are, we are working with every single community across the state in one way, shape, or form in, in any given year. Uh, bridges remains one of our biggest challenges. We have, we have a lot of bridges in our system where we have, uh, as, as a very densely populated state with a lot of hills and a lot of rivers to cross, we have a lot of bridges to take care of. And um, so it's one of our biggest programs. Uh, we also have, uh, again, many lane miles of interstate and one of the most extensive tunnel systems in the world. Again, all things that you, you are all aware of. But it's a lot of responsibility for our staff, uh, it's, it, and we have a staff that's been steadily growing. We are uh, somewhere between 2,800 and 3,000 employees right now, and uh, that's, that, uh, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for everybody in the industry right in, in, in our line of work to get good staff and to keep them. We've, done, we've been pretty successful in doing that, however. Uh, next slide. As I mentioned, we touch pretty much every part of Massachusetts. We, we are, it, chances are pretty good that on your way here, you passed one of our projects or we are in, in your town already. And if we're not in there right now, we will be in the near future. Uh, this, this map right here shows all the different project areas that we had completed in this past year and the various project types. Uh, again, bridge, bridge is the largest part of our investment program. That's, that's the area that we have both the most need and it has the most expense associated with it. But uh, again, it, it's, we have a really broad program that touches a lot of different factors, whether it's, it's uh, working to upgrade our existing systems, um, both our, our roadways, our municipal roadways uh, for things like ADA compliance or adding bike lanes 
et cetera, or, or doing, a, doing a big bridge. It, we, we do a lot of different things, and we have good staff that manage that throughout our districts. Next slide, please. So this is the one that really tells the story of how uh, the, the in federal investment has really increased our, our scope, our project scope over the last few years. It's both been a huge opportunity and a huge amount of work. And uh, the, the numbers to remember here is uh, to pretty, pretty much simplify it. These are, this represents projects that are in our existing capital program under construction. Right, right now we're hitting, uh, our existing program is at about $4.7 billion worth of contracts under, under construction right now. Uh, that's going to grow very quickly over the next few years. And by 2026, we will be at 12, 12 billion. So we're at 4 billion now, we'll be at 12 billion in just a few years. That's a huge number, it's a huge challenge. Uh, how do we manage that? We do it in a number of ways. We, we saw this coming, uh, thankfully, maybe not as big as we expected, but the legislature in Massachusetts uh, passed uh, a number of uh, a number of <coughs> bills for us a few years ago in advance of the federal government acting, and that gave us a jump start. We, so we the, the big one for us was the it was called the Next Gen Bridge Program, uh, that's now incorporated into our regular program. Um, we started planning for that right away as soon as we knew the money was coming. I think I think many of you are aware of that program, but we. Uh, we had a huge jump start on the feds when they rolled out theirs, and that gave us a big advantage because we did a couple of big things. One, we really pushed our hiring program and we, we added on, uh, I, I believe it was just shy of 350 staff over the last few years. Uh, it, that was a huge effort, and again, something that we were really happy to have a jump start on. I think the other big thing, though, that we've embraced at MassDOT throughout the organization, but Highway was, was one of the early parts of it, is uh, we, we use an agile method of, of identifying uh, various inefficiencies within our program and then working on them with our staff at every level. And th those, that effort has really, really helped dramatically. Uh, John Bouchard here, who's, who's usually in this seat, John and I share the same haircut as you probably know, but uh, John, John's day-to-day -day responsibility is focusing on our advertisement program, which was also uh, uh, bigger than ever this year. And part of the reason that we were able to put out such a big ad program is because John and his team worked so hard to identify those areas where uh, we knew we could do better and shorten up the time frame that it took to put those projects around. There's still work to do, uh, but we, we've done a ton of work on, on making that portion far more efficient than it has been in the past, and we're continuing to, to focus on it. The other big area that we really accelerated dramatically was that time frame that is usually in between when you advertise a project and then when you give a notice to proceed. I believe John, help keep me honest, how many days did we cut out? Was it 180? 180. 180 days we cut out of that, of that program over uh, in the couple years prior. And uh, we did that in a lot of ways. A lot of it is just really just being very, very focused on where the areas were that we knew we could shorten them up and then holding our own staff accountable, applying metrics to them, doing regular check-ins, and that, that has really uh, helped, again, dramatically. But uh, we have a big program ahead of us. We're, we're gonna continue to, to hire against it and make sure that we have the people we need to get it done. And uh, we're going to continue to identify those efficiencies so that we, we can make sure it's delivered in the best way possible. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm, I'm just gonna kinda hit a few more metrics for you. Uh, again, this, is, this, this whole uh, presentation is really just meant to be a conversation starter. I, I personally don't get in front of the MPO very often, and uh, although, again, I work more directly with a lot of cities and towns on a regular basis, this, this is an important conversation, so I'm, I'm honestly far more interested to get feedback from all of you than, uh, than necessarily give you, give you our day-to-day -day metrics, which can be pretty boring, but uh, bottom line is we, we, have, we have a lot of projects that are, that are in the pipeline and a lot of projects coming, that, as evidenced by that last slide, and there's, there's just kind of presenting some of that data a little bit differently. Um, next slide. All right, so we, we are, uh, as you look at what, what is ahead and what we just got done, I'm gonna kinda give you the wrap up of where we were in construction. So uh, you, you can see that there's not quite a ski slope, but it's a pretty sharp increase. And uh, in fiscal year 24, 2.3 billion, almost 2.4 billion uh, of investments that, that are going on. Again, pretty, pretty big and rapidly growing. Next slide, please. 
So some of the some of the projects in construction that are affecting people every day. This is our biggest year ever as far as contracts. Uh, again, under both both un projects under contract, but also construction dollars being spent. And some of those uh, are attributed to some of our bigger projects that we were going through with uh, rapid replacements like Sumner Tunnel, et cetera, which is actually the first on my list here. But uh, we completed a lot of big ones this year. Northampton, uh, the Sumner Tunnel Project, one of our more visible ones. Uh, North Washington Street Bridge uh, hit, hit some peak areas and is uh, wrapping up in about a year. Uh, well, not quite a year, but uh, uh, wrapping up quickly. So we're, we're happy to get that one done. And then we have uh, Canton Norwood Interchange uh, construction as well, also going on. Next slide, please. So we are hitting the peak stage for some really big projects. And these are ones that if you, if you travel the state much at all, you are certain to have driven by at least one of them. Uh, Moffa Way, one of, one of our bigger ones in the Boston area, but as you, as you start heading west, uh, you're gonna see some pretty, pretty big projects on, on some of our turnpike interchanges. Uh, those, in many cases, are, are major safety improvements that we had in the pipeline for a number of years, and then the reality of the new federal investment allowed us to actually get those off the ground. So 49590, for example, was a, uh, is a huge project that's been underway now for, for a few years. That's hitting peak construction period right now. Uh, Montgomery Russell, again, all across the state. Fall, Fall River, one of our, uh, a project that's been going really, uh, really well for us. Uh, Linsaga Strawbridge. The, uh, and then Char Charlton Oxford Route 20, uh, major, major safety improvement for that particular corridor that again was, was in the pipeline for a long time. Next slide, please. All right, and then uh, projects that are going to be coming up uh, or that started this year and then coming up. If we, again, I won't, I won't read through this list, but I'm gonna point out a couple of them. Uh, I want to point out the, the, the turnpike tunnel uh, lighting project. We, these are, that's a good example of projects that we're continuing to identify that uh, we know has uh, major impacts as far as climate and resiliency goes. A number of these are like that. Newton Western Interchange, another big, big safety improvement on the turnpike and it'll also improve traffic flow through that, that particular bottleneck. Um, and then uh, Tobin Bridge Repairs, we're going through a deletting uh, pro project right now that, that is well underway and uh, will be wrapping up in about a year. Uh, next slide, please. And then I'll, I'll kind of leave this here. This is my last slide, but it gives you, again, a, a good look ahead for, for what's coming in 2025. And, and, uh, and again, I've already discussed beyond is that we have, we have major program investments happening all over the state and, and again, working, working directly with all of you to make sure that those investments are meeting everybody's needs. So we have a lot coming up this year. Uh, again, we have some really big projects that are in the pipeline uh, that are a couple of years out, including our two mega projects with uh, both Alston and Cape Cod bridges. Those are, those are taking, as you can imagine, a pretty sizable amount of resources for, within the highway division and throughout Mass DOT to make sure those, those projects get delivered and, and we are all laser focused <coughs> on making sure those happen while at the same time working, uh, working to make sure that the rest of our program, which is also quite large, doesn't, doesn't suffer as a result of those. So um, i feeling pretty good about where we are with things. Again, we're, we're, uh, as you look at across the board. It's not that we, we can um, slow down on things like hiring and, and investment of these programs, but we're, we're all moving in the right direction and we have uh, strong support, uh, probably the strongest support I've seen in my career, frankly, from, from the governor's office and from the legislature. And uh, ultimately, we have a lot of work to do in transportation uh, it, of all modes, but uh, I'm feeling pretty good about the direction that we're going in. Uh, and with that, David, that's the end of my presentation, and I think we're Questions? Yes, thank you, Administrator. Um, so I promised both their staffs that they'd be out of here by 1015, which leads us perfectly online for our 20 minute conversation by MB MPO board members. So is there anyone who would like to make a comment or has a question for either the Secretary or the Administrator? Mayor Ballantyne. Thank you, so mine is, is a comment. So first I wanna thank the MPO staff and fellow board members uh, and to the Secretary and Highway Administrator uh, for all the work that you do here. I'm very honored to serve as an MPO board member representing not just Somerville, taking that regional approach, but truly an equity, uh, regional equity approach is um, but representing the entire inner core subregion. 
Um, I'm proud of the work uh, that we all as an MPO have um, accomplished uh, in 2023 uh, since our last uh, annual meeting. And um, most importantly, over the past year, the MPO has supported once in a generation federal investments in our infrastructure. And uh, I believe we've set the standard, the MPO, in terms of how we work together. We've maintained excellent working relationships in the municipal, state, and federal agencies, and, and many serving diverse regional um, uh, partners. So, uh, you know, that's the standard. Uh, those relationships, of course, will be that much more important in the year ahead. So I'm glad that uh, we have that strong uh, foundation and strategy. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, our approach in Somerville is a regional approach. We are a pass-through community, but we can't do it alone, whether it's housing, whether it's transportation, whether it's mitigating against rats. You know, they know no boundaries. So, um, you know, I take great pride <laughs> in Somerville's uh, service on the MPO, and especially with my designees, Tom Bent, and Brad Rawson, um, that we're able to come together and really talk on some important issues. So uh, please continue to use them as a resource, use me as a resource. Yes, we will come to you. So thank you for that open invitation. And uh, I look forward to the important work that we all will be doing together. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Others? Lindsay? Good morning. Uh, my name is Lindsay Heffernan. I'm the MBTA's Chief of Policy and Strategic Planning, and I'm standing in today uh, for General Manager Phil Ang, who could not be here. Um, I want to also thank everybody who has spoken before me and the support that we also, similar to Administrator um, Gulliver, have had from the Healy Driscoll administration. It has been a remarkable year uh, for, for the MBTA. As a permanent member of the MBTO board, um, of the MPO board, excuse me, the MBTA deeply appreciates our longstanding partnership with the MPO and its constituent municipalities and staff. And we take our responsibilities on this board very seriously. I want to take a moment this morning uh, to, in addition to appreciating the work of the MPO, talk a little bit about where the MPO, where the MBTA, my goodness, I'm having a hard time delineating those two, uh, stands uh, relative to our engagement with regional priorities and talk especially about our planning work. As many of you know, under the tenure of GM Ang, the T has been doing an immense amount of work to revitalize and rebuild our public transit system and to establish proactive processes and systems to break a cycle of disinvestment and poor repair that we have experienced over and over again. We know much of this work has been very painful to our riders and to some of your staff uh, as well. Um, uh, and uh, we are thrilled to say that the track improvement program, removing all the slow zones in the system is nearing its conclusion. As of this morning, if we look back a year ago today, we had 191 slow zones across our heavy and light rail system, and we have four. Uh, so. <laughs> uh. That took an incredible partnership from so many of you, um, from pop-up bus lanes to signage to uh, assistance on, on funding and other matters. So I'm just deeply, deeply appreciative. Um, and at, as, I, as I think about that, though, with most of that work under our belt, uh, we are now turning as an organization to a what comes next, right? So just fixing it is important, but we have to be better than that. Um, and so uh, we know this is a question that the MPO is also deeply interested in, uh, in terms of the municipalities that are represented here. We have a number of initiatives underway that are, are going to help us answer that question of what is next. We recently presented a one-year update to on the MBTA's strategic plan to our board. I encourage you to look on our website at that strategic report, uh, demonstrating a lot of our progress in the, in the last year. Um, my team is leading up some of the work to help envision what is the future of service at the MBTA? Where do we want to be 10 years from now? And we're preparing for the next program for mass transit, our 25-year capital plan for meeting the region's needs, which of course will be managed in partnership with our friends and colleagues 
colleagues at MassDOT's Office of Transportation Planning. We look forward to conversations with the MPO under both of these planning efforts, both for service and for capital needs. And of course, we cannot ignore uh, the question of funding. We get asked it by many of you uh, and, uh, and appreciate you as colleagues. We know the MBTA is facing a significant uh, uh, fiscal cliff next year. And if we want service to improve even beyond that, that, that gap will grow. We are grateful for the flexed funding that this MPO has been able to, that we've been able to receive in recent years from this board. Um, and the way both the board and the staff have worked to bring us into, into the planning processes and we have attempted to do a better job incorporating all of you in our processes. We work towards the release next of the Healy Driscoll Administration's Transportation Funding Task Force. We value and emphasize um, for all of you the importance of your regional leadership in many of these conversations. We know MPO board members play a very important role in advocates in your local communities, and, um, and we know that you are often talking to legislators, uh, and frankly, the importance of public transit, uh, many of you aspire and bring to those conversations, and we appreciate that. We are doing our work uh, to fix our network, to modernize our system, to try to communicate, communicate transparently, control our costs and whenever we can, and to tell our story. And it's important to me personally, and I know uh, to Phil, that we want to bring you all into that work as we look forward um, to coming back here soon to tell more, talk more with the board about our future plans and how we can work together with all of the communities represented. I want to thank um, Laura Gilmore and Sandy Johnston, our regular members here. They're certainly a good place to start, but as has been said by those before me, my door is always open. If you want to talk about what you want to see for public transit in your area. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay. Mayor Fuller. I've been coached to turn on the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I want to thank the secretary, um, all the members of the MPO, and can I especially lift up the staff today? Um, I do appreciate the opportunity that has been given to the city of Newton and me and David Kozis and others in, on our staff at Newton to continue to serve on this critically important organization. I want to echo what the secretary's opening remarks said. Uh, clearly, the leadership of our country in Washington, D.C. is in transition, and I think that means that what we have done over the years as an MPO, we actually have to double down on uh, advocating, speaking out, and planning for the future. It's that regional discussions and regional planning it's the heart and soul of the mission of the MPO and the work we do together um, and of MPOs across the country. Um, the Secretary, Jonathan Gulliver, Lindsay, have already spoken of the significant challenges we're facing. Yep, the huge operating deficit that the MBTA is facing. Um, Jonathan just focused on one part of our aging infrastructure, and there are more. Um, the secretary said it well, the amount and scale of projects that are not just underway, but are worthy of investment um, is mind boggling. Um, I would say we're all used to having more projects than money. Uh, we certainly on a tiny scale have it in Newton, but the, the gap is so large now that we've got to figure out. Um, I heard the doing it efficiently that um, being echoed in the opening comments, but the more part of it in terms of the funding is equally real. Um, um, let me close with two last thoughts. We can do this. It is a Rubik's Cube. Transportation, land use, jobs and economic development, and housing. Um, it is a challenge, and 
I have such confidence in the people and the values um, around that I see at this conference table, and there's so many more online, um, for we have to do what the secretary said. We've got to make sure that for our young people, our kids, our grandkids, uh, this continues to be an amazing region to live and to work and to go to school and to stay. It's all about that. Um, so thank you to MassDOT, to the MBTA, and all our other transportation planners. You're making a profound and important impact on all our lives in Newton and beyond. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yasha? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Yasha Franklin Hodge, and I serve as Chief of Streets for the City of Boston. And I wanted to offer some uh, remarks on behalf of Mayor Wu, who sends her regrets um, for uh, not being able to attend in person this year. Um, so, just to start with, you know, I want to say thank you to the MPO, to MAPC, to the leadership at MassDOT, um, to the Healy Driscoll administration, to the MBTA, right? It's very clear to us and from all the remarks we're hearing about the partnership that ultimately is what makes this region work. And uh, I'm just grateful to be here with uh, so many uh, great partners uh, as we uh, you know, kick off another year uh, of planning work. Uh, the City of Boston deeply values our partnership with the MPO. Uh, together, we're working to make our region's transportation system safer, more accessible, and more resilient to climate change. Um, this work and, this, and with, these, with this work and these investments, we have the opportunity to boost economic growth and reduce some of the inequities uh, of access and opportunity that persist in our region. Um, we've been honored to chair the TIP Process Engagement and Readiness Committee and have welcomed the opportunity to help guide the MPO's capital planning to support projects uh, that are true regional priorities and that advance shared vision, things like regional rail uh, initiatives. Uh, Boston may be the largest city in the region, but we believe in the value of programs that benefit every community uh, and that better connect us as a region. And safety remains at the heart of uh, Boston's transportation goals. By aligning Boston's uh, Vision Zero Action Plan with the regional and statewide safety efforts uh, underway, we can work to further reduce uh, injuries and deaths uh, on our roadways. But we also have to recognize as we do that that risk is not evenly spread and make sure that we are investing in the places where um, this crisis is most acutely felt. Uh, progress on safety, unfortunately, has slowed and in some cases uh, reversed in recent years. And um, I think, as we all know, there are many factors behind that. But now is a moment where it, all of us, I think, need to take stock of what's working, uh, to look at what we can learn from one another, and to redouble the efforts that we have made to protect people on our roadways. Um, we also know that transportation is a leading source of emissions responsible for climate change, uh, and transit is a powerful tool to address that. Uh, we have to support policies that incentivize transit use and shift the balance uh, of our transportation system towards cleaner and more efficient uh, modes of, of transportation. Uh, under GM Eng's leadership, the MBTA, as we've heard, has made uh, a critical progress in eliminating slow zones, restoring confidence in transit, and growing ridership. Uh, regional transit authorities have also uh, set a great example with their fare-free pilots, which, as we've heard, are now state policy. And I think it's just, it's no exaggeration to say that um, if transit doesn't work, Boston doesn't work. The region doesn't work. Um, there is nothing more essential to uh, our uh, functioning than uh, continuing to make the sustained investments in connectivity, in reliability, in affordability in the transit system. This is how we unlock growth. This is how we address our housing crisis. This is how we improve quality of life for everyone in the region, no matter how they travel. Um, Looking ahead, I think we all see on the horizon the uh, fiscal challenges facing the MBTA. Um, you know, the looming uh, fiscal cliff demands a source of stable funding, and Boston is committed to uh, advocating at both the state and the federal level for the resources that our transit system needs. 
And as we've all talked about, uh, whether it's transit or highway or city projects, um, you know, we have to work together as we, uh, you know, to, to prioritize uh, spending and to make sure that we're uh, finding the best strategies that we can to address cost escalation. You know, this is a, a factor that is, is impacting every single one of us and uh, is crucial to this question of whether we'll be able to deliver uh, what our constituents need and expect uh, of us. Um, with uncertainty about the future of federal support for many of our priorities, I think this approach of regional cooperation and collaboration is, is even more important um, uh, than it has been. Uh, and so while that regional cooperation is also, is you know, a lot about working together and aligning priorities together, it's also about learning together. And so we are excited to be, uh, to support upcoming demonstration projects to help build the toolbox for improving transit efficiency, for emissions reduction, for multimodal safety, um, and uh, committed to uh, working with and learning from and, and sharing our learnings with all of you. Uh, so just to close, I think, you know, Boston is dedicated to being an engaged partner in the MPO. We look forward to the work ahead. Um, our region's future depends on today's decisions, and uh, it's really only through this collaboration that we can unlock the uh, growth potential and uh, the potential to build a stronger and more sustainable greater Boston region. So thank you all for uh, being a part of this with us. Thank you, Yasha. Other questions or comments? Andy. Um, let's see. So, um, I have a few prepared remarks actually for the advisory council. Um, and for many of you all, I'm sure you know that the advisory council is going through an organizational transition. And so kind of reflecting on, you know, start doing different things. I think the MPO staff has actually really taken on that kind of, um, theme. Um, we actually had our last regular session as this cohort of the advisory council yesterday. Um, and on behalf of Len and the other, uh, the current chair and the other members, um, we actually, I pulled three reflections from that meeting that I think would be useful for a conversation. So um, with the RTAC, I think everybody mentioned um, that they learned something and gained something valuable through the experience of participating in the advisory committee. Um, and that's uh, folks that don't necessarily have transportation planning experience. And so that was, an invaluable way that people can learn about these processes, learn how to participate, uh, and really feel empowered to have the conversations in their community that they really wanna have about how people get around. Um, I think one thing that MPO staff mentioned that I, I can't not share is that uh, this group has really provided value in working to remind planners to keep the focus on those people who are moving around in the region, in their municipalities, in their communities, even while maybe the conversation at the MPO is about the discussion of which projects are considered for funding, you know, what studies are looking toward the future, and that's really how this uh, group can really provide the most value to this board. Um, finally, I think one wish that came out of that conversation is that the advisory council, even though as it like, you know, makes this transition, um, what the focus on, um, what our wish is that the focus can remain on the region as a whole. Um, including especially thinking about planning over the administra uh, administrative boundaries that we call cities and towns, RTAs, um, so that folks can continue to have a cohesive transportation system that, um, you know, kind of crosses over these administrative lines. So even though we're in this moment of transition, um, you know, I think we wanted to continue to participate in the discussion as individuals, but also as this new format of the advisory council takes place to continue to have the conversations with this group. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Mark? Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it'll be too loud. David, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to raise a couple of, um, a couple of issues that are a little more um, narrow bore. Uh, but first, I just want to uh, explain that our Director of Transportation, who's usually in this seat, Eric Barassa, mm -hmm. is unfortunately ill today. I think he is listening virtually. Couldn't pull him away that much. <laughs> but, uh, but he sends his apologies. He can't be here. I can be here through the break. Uh, and then at that time, Judy Wallace, who is our Assistant Director of Transportation, will take my place and Eric's place for the remainder of the meeting. Uh, Eric would never miss an annual meeting of the MPO if he could possibly be here. 
Um, I do want to thank uh, the mayors, the secretary, the administrator, et cetera, for some very lofty and inspiring remarks thus far today, but I am going to mention a narrow issue uh, that is very particular to this MPO and I think some of the others. And I hope the administrator can stay for a couple of moments, but I don't know if he can. I will. Thank you very much. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that, Jonathan. No subtle. I'll be quick. <laughs> I'm known for nothing else. Um, we, we have an issue in this MPO with the readiness of TIP projects. The staff and the board work exceptionally hard on the decisions that they make about what goes on the tip and in what time frame. And when I first arrived at NMAPC, which is 22 years ago now, GM Betty was already here. We were both very young men uh, at that point in time. Uh, we had a similar problem. It was very difficult to actually get the tip projects to move forward according to the schedule they were in. And we all worked very hard and we solved that problem. And it remained solved for many years and things began to advance much better. In recent years, for whatever reason, it seems we put the projects on the tip, we can't get them designed and finished and ready in time. MassDOT and the MBTA have to move in at that point with other projects and the MPO very quickly has to decide to fund those other projects. And those are worthy projects as well, but the local projects keep getting rolled down the line. And that's very difficult for our cities and towns. It also messes with the objective of this MPO to accomplish a lot of local projects. I don't think it's any one entity's fault. I think that MassDOT and the cities and towns and the consulting community and the staff at the MPO all need to work together to try and figure out what is actually causing these delays and how can we solve them so that our projects are ready to move forward according to the schedule that we actually put on the tip. And I'd like to suggest for consideration that a committee should be established of MPO members, folks from the administrator's office, maybe some of the other MPOs in the rest of the state that are also facing some of these similar issues to really dig down and figure out how we can solve this problem. So I just wanted to have an opportunity to mention that if I could. Mark, thank you. And I'm glad I did say for that. Uh, this is, uh, you're, you're, the issue that you just outlined is a problem we, we also recognize, and uh, the governor, lieutenant governor also recognize as well. And we've had many discussions with the administration about how do we resolve it. And I think as you, you, you articulated better than I could, there are multiple reasons for it. Uh, and it's hard to, it's hard to identify uh, a silver bullet solution here. I think it is a collection of, of different things that we can all work on together to try to get to a, a better spot to keep, get, the more, get more consistency. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, we have done a lot of work. John's team has done uh, a ton of work to make sure that the any given advertisement year is has a, a, a similar number of projects per quarter. I, as you know, it wasn't that long ago that we did like 80% of our advertisement in the fourth quarter. That's not like that anymore, and that was a huge effort to get through. Uh, but I think a similar effort needs to be taken on, on exactly the issue you're describing, which is trying to get uh, more reliability in the different projects to make sure they, d if, it doesn't matter if we're doing 100 projects per year, if 80 of them are different ones than expected, that's still an issue and we recognize that. And, and I, think if we, uh, I think if we work together, identify those issues, Issues. We'd be happy to take the help from uh, from uh, not only this MPO but others as well to try to get to that. We are doing a. We have just started a process. Um, it just just the last couple of months of really kind of digging through the various steps of uh, of those of those different projects and kind of identifying where we think the tripping points are and where we think that um, the opportunities are. And I think if you gave us uh, maybe into the early part of the new year, we can we can circle back with uh, with OTP and with the MPO to, to get some get some folks together to go through some of those results and, and get your input on where you're seeing some of those problems as well. Sounds good. So I, I think it's definitely a problem worth solving. Thank you. You can go now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Dennis. Well. No, thank you. Yeah, I'll be brief, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I just wanted to um, recognize and welcome our newest member uh, to the MPO, the RTA. Uh, it's, uh, I want to thank our federal partners for making the case uh, for the RTA to be uh, part of the MPO. Uh, welcome, Jim. Uh, Jim uh, from Metro West RTA is representing the RTAs for the first term. Uh, it's an equity issue, I think, that we all recognize. I wanted to thank the MPO for uh, listening to that voice of, the, of our federal partners and putting uh, the ATE on our board. I also want to thank the uh, Healy and Driscoll administration for their commitment uh, to the RTAs. It's become a, an important uh, 
transportation partner in our region, um, and uh, the establishment of the RTAs were critically important. And I want to also thank the legislature for also the funding um, that has been established over the last couple of years for the RTA. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dennis. Any other comments at this time? Brian Kane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on Mayor Fuller's uh, remarks earlier and, and thank some CTPS staff by name who do so much for us uh, every uh, month or week that we meet. Uh, and while I can't name all of them, I did want to recognize uh, Tag and Tyke, who is uh, the executive director, who uh, worked with um, an ad hoc committee a couple of years ago to put together this annual meeting, which I think is a wonderful innovation. Gina Peril, the deputy director, continues to do amazing work every day. Uh, as the chairman of the ANF committee, I, I couldn't leave this table without thanking Haral Gandhi, who uh, is in charge of all of the finances and somehow manages to balance it all at the end of the federal fiscal year and the state fiscal year. Um, Annette Dempsher um, has been here for, for a, a long time and continues to be a stalwart, making sure that everyone's views are heard at this table, um, especially those who often um, are not, don't have the loudest voices. And Annette, we are very grateful to all you do. Uh, David Hong, who read the uh, accessibility statement, continues every meeting to um, to do a great job of ensuring that everyone is heard as well. And uh, I couldn't leave without also mentioning Ethan LaPointe, the tip manager, who somehow manages to keep $100 million worth of figures in his head all the time and can balance those numbers uh, every April somehow uh, with uh, uh, seems like a million people yelling at him. So to the CTPS staff, uh, my thanks, my gratitude, and I'm sure I speak for behalf of everyone on the board in, in, ask, in, in saying thank you for all you do for us. Thank you, Brian. Joy, would you like to say something? Administrator Singh. Thank you. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here today. I was telling Tegan this morning before the meeting that out of all of the annual meetings that I attend, this is among my very favorite, and it's not just because you have such delicious snacks before your meeting, <laughs> though that doesn't hurt, but it is because we really, uh, we at Federal Highway really enjoy the partnership that we share with the MPO, and we really feel like together we are making a difference to advance safety, equity, and excellence in transportation here. So it really is our pleasure to be here today uh, and to be able to participate in the meeting. I wanna take a moment to congratulate the Boston MPO on on being awarded two Safe Streets for All grants, uh, totaling $9.6 million. Those grants will uh, go a long way to help improve safety by giving the MPO the resources to update the action plan and to audit high-risk locations throughout the MPO. As helpful as that $9.6 million will be, it is a mere slice of the almost $2 billion that uh, have been distributed throughout the Commonwealth in grant money just this past year. So uh, $2 billion can help a lot of roads, a lot of bridges, a lot of communities to be safer. Many of the organizations, uh, cities, municipalities, and towns around this table and in this room are recipients of those grant awards. So thank you all for the diligence that you have shown in putting together the applications. It is not lost on me how much energy it takes to, uh, to get together the resources, come up with the finance plans, and, and to be able just to apply to grants, and it's a very competitive pool. We, are comp co you, we in the Commonwealth are competing uh, with agencies across the nation for these funds, so that you have been so successful, we have been so successful at receiving these grant awards as a testimony to the hard work that you and your teams are putting in and the strong cases that you're making for the improvements that we want to see here in the Commonwealth. So congratulations on receiving those grant awards. In addition, we want to thank the MPO for updating the MOU uh, and incorporating the voting rights of the two RTAs serving the MPO communities. Thank you also for adopting an operations plan that institutionalizes the MPO processes. Both of these are changes that were recommended uh, in the 2022 MPO certification review and seeing them implemented uh, just furthers our, our belief that we make a strong partnership and that together we can, we can really make some positive changes in transportation here in Boston. 
And finally, we really appreciate the work that the MPA is doing to, MPO is doing to identify and advance a sufficient pipeline of locally and regionally developed projects to fully utilize target funding, such as developing uh, the TIP subcommittee and implementing federally funded design pilot. Congratulations on all of these successes. Uh, we, are, we are very excited to continue our partnership with the MPO and to be a resource in any way possible. And finally, on a, uh, a somewhat personal note, when I was here last year, uh, I told you that we'd recently relocated and we're having trouble finding a home. I am thrilled to report that we are not, in fact, living in a tent uh, uh, underneath an interstate bridge. We did, in fact, find a home, and it's great to be a part of the community and falling more in love with the Boston community every day. Stay tuned for part two next year, because not only did we relocate, but we succeeded in convincing our daughter that Boston was basically the same as Amsterdam. And after five years of living in Amsterdam, she relocated here and is looking to purchase her first home and make Massachusetts her long-term home. So whenever she starts to doubt that this really is like Amsterdam part two, I just drive her around Beacon Hill and say, look, it's Amsterdam. It's basically the same. So uh, thank you all for welcoming us into the community and for the great work that uh, we are thrilled to partner with you uh, through Federal Highway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hissing. Mr. A. Butler. Thank you, Dave. And I have the unenviable job to just follow up from Joy. And what I'd like to do is just very briefly echo and amplify just uh, the immense gratitude FTA has for the work you, you all do each and every day. And also just to briefly touch upon the mayor's as well as the secretary's comments about housing and transportation. We get it. It is literally in FTA's mission statement, improving America's communities through public transportation. And we are so proud of everything you've been to accomplish towards this mission uh, over this past year. It has just been a wonderful partnership. And as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law, FTA's annual program has grown from 13 billion to 21 billion. And the Commonwealth has certainly benefited from this growth. Over the next year, we expect to award $600 million in discretionary funds to enhance all types of transit in the Boston region, from upgrading historic core assets of the subway systems to draw one, to expanding bus priority networks and renovating ferry infrastructure. All of that is a result of the work you do each and every day to support FTA and our transit colleagues. It all starts right here. We look forward to working with you uh, together in the upcoming year. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the MPO board members at this time? Seeing none, next item on our agenda is the welcome by the executive director. Sorry, thank you. All right, hi everyone. I'm Tegan Tyke. I'm the executive director of the staff to the Boston Region MPO. And um, it's hard to give a welcome now after all of these amazing comments have already been made, <laughs> but um, I do wanna say welcome to this second annual meeting that we have had as an MPO. Brian mentioned that this is a newer endeavor, and I think it's a really important one. We hold this within a month after the um, each year's elections of new or returning board members, and we do so as an opportunity to really celebrate and reinforce what we do as a metropolitan planning organization to set the stage for the successful collaboration throughout the year that we all engage in to study, plan, analyze, and invest in the transportation system that we envision for the 97 cities and towns in the Boston region. So I know that everybody's time is precious, but I really appreciate everybody's time spent today to do this reflection with each other and to also talk about what we've accomplished recently and what we're going to accomplish in the coming year. But as a result of the election, um, I do want to wel welcome back continuing members and new members. Um, first, I'd like to personally welcome back Arlington in the at-large seat. 
represented by um, John Alessi right now on behalf of um, Select Board Steve DeCourcy. I wanted to welcome back Burlington in the North Suburban Planning Council seat with Melissa Tentakalis, who is not here today, who represents Select Board Chair Joseph E. Morandi. And I'd also, of course, like to welcome back Newton in the at-large city seat. Welcome back, Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller. And also welcome back to your designees who have had long service on this board and done a lot of work to advance regional goals. And then I'd also like to welcome back Norwood for the Three Rivers Interlocal Council seat with Tom O'Rourke representing Select Board Chair Matthew Lane. So thank you to you all returning. And again, this was actually just mentioned. Thank you to all of you who signed the MPO's new 2024 Memorandum of Understanding as Administrator Singh referenced, that added for the first time since 2011 a new seat to the MPO board. Um, I want to extend my welcome also to the regional transportation transit authorities, Metro West and Cape Ann, who now share a rotating seat on the board. And so the seat this um, cycle will be held by Jim Nee on behalf of Metro West, so welcome, but also welcome to Kata, who's represented by Felicia Webb. So together here at the table, with the other chief executive officers, including agency leadership, elected officials, um, and other um, members of this board, you collectively represent the 97 cities and towns in the Boston region in an essential regional planning process. MPOs are established through federal legislation as decision-making bodies to ensure that federal funds are invested responsibly, in particular, bringing together local and community needs in a space with regional and state stakeholders, and that is an essential process. Um, if you remember, if you attended the meeting last year, I took some time to set the historical context for why MPOs exist and the work that we do, emerging during an era of nationwide highway building in response to local pro protests on the impacts of that highway building on vulnerable communities. And emerging from that, we continue to work to address and ideally reverse those harms that were done to vulnerable populations as a result of that era of highway building with less intense focus that we do here now today on the needs of all the people in the region. And so as a governing board, I also um, thank you, Brian, for mentioning staff members. I wanted to emphasize to you all that your decision making is supported by a staff of about 55 transportation planners, data analysts, data scientists, engagement and communication experts, and others. And many of them are in the room here today. And I greatly appreciate that they also have an opportunity to hear the comments of the board members today. And also, please recognize that they are the ones who are doing the work all year round to make sure that you have what you need to make informed decision making as part of this process. So I, I also want to thank staff. And with that, I just want to go back to enthusiastically welcoming you all. Um, thank you for the remarks that you've already made in support of regional planning and collaboration, because I think those remarks really help illuminate what we can accomplish together with local, regional, and state partners in the room. I'm looking forward to the rest of the agenda, which will include, um, I believe we'll be moving up, um, perhaps the, the vote of the vice chair. Um, and then we'll have a presentation from the National Association of, of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, AMPO, which will ground us in the evolution of the next transportation reauthorization legislation and what that will mean for the MPOs and how they are looking at that in terms of the needs of MPOs across the country. Um, and then there will be a break and also a public comment period. And then we will have several presentations from my staff and others, myself and other staff, which will be brief, but are really important to highlight the impact of the planning and capital investments that you all have made over this past year, and also how we approach our strategy to harness grant opportunities to enhance those impacts. And then we will complete our business with confirming the slates of committee chairs for the year, or committee members for the year. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to move us on in the agenda. Move this back. Thank you, Tegan. As Tegan mentioned, we're going to move up item 12, the election of the vice chair, so Mark can be here while we elect MAPC. So at our last meet, well, at our last meeting, we took nominations. There was a single nomination, MAPC. Um, if anybody would like to make another nomination, now is the time. Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to uh, approve MAPC as our vice chair? Please state your name for the record. Brian King. I am delighted to nominate MAPC for the position of vice chair. And while Mark is here today, I, I also want to echo the great work that Eric Barassa does uh, for, for all of us on this board and especially to represent MAPC. They will be wonderful vice chairs uh, again for the well, 20th year in a row, but uh, it'll, be, it, it'll be a continuation of great work. So I'm happy to do that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you. Motion have been made and seconded. David, please call the roll. Yes. Uh, David Moeller. Yes. John Bichard. We'll return. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Lindsay Heffernan. 
Lindsay Heffernan, yes. Sarah Lee? Yes. Mark Drazen? Yes. Brian Kane? Kane, yes. Yasha Franklin Hodge? Yes. Chen Rao? Yes. Uh, Eric Molinari? Yes. Mayor Ruthann Fuller? Yes. John Alessi? Yes. Bernard Green? Yes. Mayor Katja Ballantyne? Yes. Kristen Guichard? Yes. Dennis Giambetti? Yes. Darlene Wynn? Yes. I believe uh, Melissa Tentopoulos? Yes. Thank you. Um, Chris Diorio? Erwin Nessoff for Chris, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Rachel Benson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Tom O'Rourke? Yes. With that, motion carries. Thank you. Next up is a presentation on federal policy priorities by Caitlin Cook, the Transportation Planning Director of the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, otherwise known as AMPO. Um, Sarah, it might be easier if you Point of order, Mr. Chairman. two seats down. What? Point of order? Yes. Jim didn't get to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. My sincere apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Jim Nee. Yes. <laughs> sorry, Jim. My apologies. My apologies. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Sarah, it might be easier since she's going to be at the podium behind you if you moved over. Since Melissa's not here and Rachel's not here, they're online. Yep. Whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, everybody, for having me. As David said, my name is Caitlin Cook. I'm the Transportation Planning Director with the National Association of MPOs based out of Washington, D.C. And I just want to say thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you to the Chair and to Tegan for inviting me and giving me time on today's agenda. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about AMPO, but really focus in on our legislative priorities for the upcoming reauthorization. Next slide. And I have a few slides here to walk us through what those legislative priorities look like. I know our executive director, Bill Carews, was able to join you last year and share kind of our initial legislative priorities. Since then, we've had quite a bit of time to refine those, and we've recently published detailed reports on each of those. Next slide. So about AMPO, if, if you are new to the board or if you haven't had an opportunity to interact with us yet, we are the National Association representing over 400 MPOs across the nation, from Alaska and Hawaii to Montana, central Louisiana. We represent all sizes, regions, political affiliations that you can think of. Um, no MPO is the same. There are no apple-to-apple -apple comparison. Boston itself is actually a very unique MPO. Um, we're always excited to hear what you're doing here. And I like to point that out because when we talk about our legislative priorities, it's important to note that there is no one size fits all. And you'll see that reflected when I discuss our approach to these priorities. Our interest is going to be creating as much flexibility as possible so that we can accommodate all types and all needs of our members. So we have been in existence for 30 years. It is our birthday year. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, we, like I said, serve all MPOs, and we really focus on two things. We focus on research, and we focus on policy. Today, we'll, we'll spend that time on policy. Next slide. So at our recent conference, we were in Salt Lake City in September, and we released our second iteration of our Steering Ahead. It is a roadmap for reauthorization, the transportation bill that funds the bread and butter funds that you see here at the MPO. We have five main priorities. The first one is to increase planning funds. So those are the funds that staff uses um, to their day-to-day -day operations, planning studies, things like that. Um, the next one is looking at shifting certain discretionary funding to formula. We'll dig into that in a minute. We also are looking to reduce local match requirements for federal transportation programs. We'd like to increase uniformity and in carryover policies for federal funding. And we'd also like to explore the possibility of MPOs becoming direct recipients for certain federal funds. 
Next slide, please. So the first one we're looking at is the shift of discretionary to formula funding. Now I know the Commonwealth and Boston in particular have been incredibly successful in those discretionary grant programs through the IIJA. We're very proud of the work that has gone into those applications and in implementing them. When we surveyed the membership though, and we looked at these programs nationwide, what we noticed was that it is very challenging for a lot of people. You are in an excellent place. There are regions and states across the country that have not been as successful, and there are a lot of reasons for this. We found the overwhelming majority of participants in the survey found it either moderately challenging, very challenging to apply, and that's really resources. A lot of MPOs do not have the dedicated staff to put towards putting together these applications, going after the funds. We've even heard from members that to hire a consultant, it can cost thirty to $40,000 just to put together a benefit cost analysis. So there are large barriers of entry when it comes to discretionary funding for a lot of MPOs across the country. You are a large, well-resourced MPO. Um, to put it in perspective, we have MPOs that have as small of a staff as one half-time full-time employee. Um, about 50% of MPOs in the country are actually small MPOs. Their staff size ranges anywhere from two to six staff people. Um, so that's kind of the scale that we're looking at. Now, we don't want to get rid of discretionary funding. Discretionary funding has a place, it always has had a place, and it's incredibly beneficial for advancing certain administrative priorities. But we do feel that through the IIJA, there was an overwhelming amount of discretionary funds. This placed an incredible burden on USDOT and the Secretary's office to stand up these new programs and get them out the door, as well as it placed a burden on applicants. So we believe there are certain programs that may make sense to shift to formula distribution, where everybody receives a piece of that. There are certain benefits to it. You can see there's a laundry list here. Um, the largest really being that reduced burden on the applicants, um, more equitable funding allocation, and ultimately stability in long-term planning. It can be a bit of an exercise for an MPO to apply for a grant and have to be very nimble when they get that grant. There's always, you know, a little bit of a scramble to get that program, to get it through the regional planning process. So we do feel like this shift could help MPOs better plan for their regions and anticipate more money coming to their region as well. Next slide. We'd also like to look at reducing local match. This is something that comes up with every uh, authorization bill. This is this kind of an old song and dance. I think everybody gets behind this. Uh, as you are aware, typically the federal aid highway program funds that you all deal with are an 80-20 split. So 80% federal, 20% local. It changes slightly in different states. Um, what we found through COVID and since COVID is there has been a continued issue with meeting those local match requirements. We saw um, COVID really hit the economy really hard, uh, hit cities and municipalities pretty hard, and we've seen some recovery from that, but not quite to the levels before. We think that, based on survey results, the community would be supportive of reducing local match for the planning funds. So those are the day-to-day -day operational funds that fund your staff and your planning studies. Um, as you can see in this pie chart, there's a pretty large percentage of respondents that would support some reduction, either a 100% match or at least a 90-10 split. We do believe that this would increase flexibility, it would create more stability, and ultimately it would help decrease balances. We have seen nationwide unobligated balances of federal funds have has risen. We had eight and a half billion this year. In talking to DC central office, they're anticipating even more next year. And this is a problem for us. This is a problem for our association. This is also a problem for you because it makes it incredibly difficult for us to go back to Congress and say, we need the same level of funding or even better, we need a little bit more when it doesn't look like we can draw down on those federal funds and get them spent within the timeframes they need to be spent. So we are hoping that this helps us get some federal funding out the door and spent a little bit more efficiency, efficiently. Next slide. The third legislative priority we're looking at 
um, really deals with the carryover of federal funds. I'm sure you all know with the federal funds through the Federal Aid Highway Program, there's a three plus one availability. Um, we have seen, however, the carryover balances as they've grown. We've seen carryover policies uh, change state to state. And what we're interested in is looking at greater uniformity in these carryover policies. Again, this comes down to better ability to anticipate balances and draw down with larger projects. So in this example, we're looking at the planning funds, those day-to-day -day operational funds. And the number one reason that we've identified for accrued balances are staffing shortages. This is something I hear in our executive director's meetings every quarter, and I've heard it for two years now, that we're struggling to hire, we're struggling to retain, um, and as a result, we're struggling to spend down on our operational dollars. Um, MPOs are programming the dollars. They're trying to get them out the door through the UPWP and their capital through the TIP. Um, but this has continued to be a struggle. So we are looking at ways that we can increase uniformity in the carryover policies. And we do have reports on each of these. We have a detailed report on this one as well that goes further into the reasons leading to these unobligated balances. Next slide, please. And our final legislative priority is looking at the possibility of certain MPOs becoming direct recipients of federal funds. This is a very complex uh, priority. We think there are several benefits to this. We do believe that this would increase a streamlined funding process and hopefully increase project delivery, which is something we've seen slow down. I know we mentioned earlier, getting projects through the tip seems to be an issue. You're not alone. That is a nationwide issue. Um, so we do believe that this is one thing that we can help with that process. I want to note, though, this is being explored as an opt-in program for larger resourced MPOs. There is a significant administrative burden to becoming a direct recipient. Not all MPOs should or could take this on. Again, this comes back to my original statement. We want flexibility so that those that are interested, willing, and able to take this on would have the option to. We are also looking at narrowing the focus of this to the PL and 5303, which are those staffing dollars, and starting there. Um, so you can see here that also is supported through the survey work we, we looked at. We asked larger MPOs, which are a million plus, what types they would be interested in, and 100% of them indicated the planning funds would be incredibly helpful. Next slide, please. So those are our legislative priorities. And they may seem separate, but they're all actually interconnected pretty well. We have a, a bit of a flow chart here looking at planning funds as an example. And the reason I pull this slide out every time I talk to folks is to help put these priorities into context. And that's because we can't do just one and be successful. We have to do multiple, and we have to do them in a certain order. The first thing is we'd really like to see an increase in those planning dollars so that you have more resources for the federal planning requirements that you need to do as staff. We'd like to reduce or eliminate match where we can to make those dollars go a little bit faster. And then we would look at things like direct recipient status. We recognize a lot of MPOs aren't resourced as is to become a direct recipient. They would need an increase in dollars to make that happen. So we are approaching this from a waterfall, um, recognizing that some need to go before others to make sure that we're not putting the cart before the horse and setting up the MPO community to, to not be successful with some of these. Next slide, please. And the final thing I want to note on our legislative priorities is that we are not working, previous slide, <laughs> we're not working in isolation. Uh, we meet regularly, and when I mean regularly, weekly. We are talking to our other national stakeholders. We call ourselves the LOT Coalition. You may have heard of us. Um, it is all of these national associations up on the slide, including the National League of Cities, National Association of Counties, et cetera, Council of Mayors. We meet regularly to discuss these legislative priorities and where we can coalesce and support each other and how we can approach Congress as a unified voice representing the transportation community as well 
staff, board members, all the local municipalities so that we have one strong voice when we go to Congress for reauthorization. So I wanted to highlight, this is not just AMPO, it is not AMPO staff, this is coming from our members and we are working across national associations for the entire country. And with that, I wanna spend just a couple minutes, next slide please, uh, highlighting one of our newest resources. So I mentioned at the beginning, we do two main tracks. We do policy and research. This is coming out of our research foundation and that is an MPO Institute. It is exactly how it sounds. We have created courses that are available online for anybody to take. Um, they, right now we have three courses, the MPO 101, federal funding, and a new MPO and graduated TMA course. We stood this program up with support from Federal Highway. We worked closely with them. They helped review, so did FTA, as well as over 30 MPOs across the country. So when I said there are no apples to apples comparison, let me tell you, putting these courses together gave me more than a few white hairs because everybody I talked to said, well, that's not how we do it in our region or our state. I understand. <laughs> we have created some national level courses. We do our best to provide regional examples where we can, but we are very excited to get this program rolled out. We are actually in the process of hiring a new consultant to build more courses next year, one of which is actually going to be specifically for board members. We are going to put together an MPO 101 where we're gonna cover the basics of an MPO and federal funding for board members and what your responsibilities look like serving an MPO. Next slide, please. Couple things on the Institute, I like to highlight this. We have only had this open since July 1, but I'm really excited. What you really should hone in on here is the before course and after course. We are seeing on average folks knowledge levels increase by two levels once they've taken a course. I like to highlight this because I am all about the metrics. Is it effective? And what we're seeing is that folks are walking away from these courses feeling like they have a better understanding of an MPO and what it does. These courses are for MPO staff, but they are also for transportation officials, they're for elected officials, and they're for staff within cities and counties. We have a lot of folks in our system taking these courses. We even have quite a few state DOT and even some federal partners in there as well. Next slide, please. And finally, I just wanna highlight our annual conference. We do this every year. We were in Salt Lake City this year, and next year we are gonna be right next door in Providence, Rhode Island. So I would like to invite all of you to join us. We are hoping to have that elected official course completed by then, and our plan is to teach that course in person at the annual conference. So if you're able to attend, I'd encourage you to take a look at that and consider joining us at that course. And with that, I will close out, and if we have time, I'm available for questions. Thank you so much. Questions for Ampo? Seeing none, thank you very much. It was very informative. Thank you. So now it's time on our agenda for the break. So we're good. It's, by my watch, it's 10.55, so we'll be back at 11.05, and the first item on the agenda will be public comments. Thank you. Okay, I need everybody to sit down. We're gonna start taking public comments. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is public comments. Did people sign up? We're gonna see if there's a sign-up sheet. Otherwise, I'll just call on people as they raise their hands. And please, nobody rat me out. I'm not actually allowed to have this croissant in this room. Yeah. I totally forgot the I totally forgot the rules. Yeah, I to, totally forgot the rules. Please, I'll never be allowed back in. If that were, if it was that easy, <laughs> you'd, you'd bring one in, right? I'd be bringing in. I'd be calling in lunch for everyone. <laughs> uh, I'll give us a second. So we do not have a sign-in sheet. So. I'm just gonna invite people, if you have a comment you'd like to make at this time to the MPO, please raise your hand and I will call you to the podium and then you can identify yourself. Would anybody like to make a public comment at this time? Wig, you don't even have to identify yourself, I know you. But do identify yourself when you get to the podium, please, Wig. 
for the record. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Wig Zamor, a Somerville citizen, m most well known for pro bono uh, efforts in land use, transportation, environment, and health. And I'm happy to be here. I think this is a great idea to have these annual meetings. Um, I do want to just say a few things. First, thank you very much for GLX and the path in, in Somerville. Um, that project was $2.3 billion, which is actually probably less than uh, Harvard Square Red Line station cost in, in constant dollars. And um, it was done on time and on budget once it finally got on track and, and was made a more modest project. And, and the project manager, John Dalton, sure, certainly helped a lot with that. Um, I do want to bring up one, one thing. Um, you know, we're all about land use, transportation, environment, and health, and how they, how they work, uh, work in an integrated fashion. And um, we tend to focus more on the lower budget things because the dollars can be stretched that way. But sometimes big projects are important. And I, I want to draw attention especially to the Urban Ring project, which hasn't been talked about in a few years, and specifically phase three of the Urban Ring project, and um, would suggest that that could tie together both Longwood Medical Area and Kendall Square, two of the top research areas in the United States. Um, we used to be a manufacturing economy, but we're really led by our research, uh, our research leaders, both in, in EDS and MEDS. And tying those two um, global leaders together with transit would be very helpful. Um, but I want to mention another aspect. The group that is most left out of uh, transportation equity in the United States and, and also environmental protection um, it is the uh, newer immigrant population, specifically Hispanics. And the group that would most benefit from the Urban Ring Project, if they could be included, would be the Lower Mystic to Lynn, uh, where, where most, our most concentrated environmental justice population lives. And a lot of that population is, is new immigrants and Hispanic immigrants. So I'll, I'll stop there. Just wanted to raise that as something. Maybe a UPWP study just on phase three. Um, we, we can do the bus stuff anytime we want. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments at this time? If so, please raise your hand or just walk to the podium. Seeing none, if you want to comment during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will try to call on you. Next item on the agenda is the Boston Region MPO Funding Overview and Planning Spotlight. Tegan Tyke. Oh, I looked for you to my left and you're going to the podium. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone. And um, it's nice to be back in front of you at a different angle. That's refreshing. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So again, I'm Tegan Tyke. I'm the executive director of the staff to the Boston Region MPO, and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to kick off a series of three relatively brief presentations from staff about the impact that the MPO has had through the investments of federal dollars um, in studying, planning, and analysis, as well as through capital investments. So I'm, my presentation is going to include an overview of the primary federal funding sources that the MPO's planning work and capital investments utilize, and then I will spotlight some of the work we do in the planning space. Um, one spotlight will be on the work that's primarily supported by federal discretionary grants, which was mentioned by Administrator Singh a bit earlier through the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. And that will set the stage for the second presentation by Rebecca Morgan, the MPO's Director of Projects and Partnerships, to present our strategy for accessing those discretional grant opportunities to supplement and more ambitiously advance our planning work. And then, because planning is always intended to lead towards um, actual construction and capital projects, we will have Ethan LaPointe, the Transportation Improvement Program Manager, um, highlight some of the examples of the recent MPO-funded capital projects to demonstrate the impact that they have in reaching towards the MPO's vision. So next slide, please. The MPO's vision is captured in the MPO's 20-year long-range plan, which is currently called Destination 2050. And that's the framework for how we work towards a transportation system that we envision for the 97 cities and towns in the Boston region. As it says in the vision statement, we strive to create a modern and well-maintained transportation system in support of a region that is sustainable, healthy, livable, and economically vibrant. And to get there, we have to invest in safety and resilience 
um, with, a, with a big focus on equitable access and providing a variety of ways for people with diverse needs in our region to access opportunities in our region. Next slide, please. So let's first talk about planning funding, which is what we use first to help advance our vision. That funding is primarily um, federal in its source, and it's authorized through the transportation reauthorization legislation, currently the bipartisan infrastructure law. Those federal funds, um, as has also been mentioned, um, have to be matched from local sources, typically 20% of the total funding. And in Massachusetts, that source, that local source typically comes from our state sources. Um, all of the planning work carried out in our, um, in our, the year of work that we do is captured in a unified planning work program, which is the MPO's annual plan. And the majority of that funding comes specifically from federal formula 3CPL and 5303 funds. And last year, in federal fiscal year 2024, the MPO received, the Boston Region MPO, received $5.9 million of combined federal 5303 and PL funding and the local match from state sources. And that's represented by the blue portion of the pie chart on the slide. And also thanks to the BIL, in federal fiscal year 2025, that number's gonna go up by over half a million, and we will have $6.5 million, inclusive of local match, of federal 3 CPL and 5303 funds available. The MPO also receives funding from other sources, which can be discretionary grants and also other funding from our partner agencies and cities and towns um, in, in efforts to directly support them in their planning work as well. Next slide, please. So moving from planning to capital funding, the BIL also authorizes funding for transportation construction projects in states and regions. These planned investments must be documented in the MPO's five-year capital investment plan, which is called the Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, before funding can be spent in the region. And we anticipate that about $6 billion of federal funding will be invested in the Boston region in the capital projects over the next five-year period from these federal sources. And of that $6 billion, about $4 billion is allocated based on transit agency priorities, and about $1.6 billion is allocated based on mass DOT established priorities. But also about $700 million of those federal dollars over the five-year period is solicited, scored, and selected by the MPO itself for projects that are in service to the MPO's regional goals. Um, really though, of course, it is the role of the MPO to ensure that all of the federal funding that is coming into this region is supportive of and is certainly not in conflict with the regional goals. Next slide, please. So before I get into the spotlights, I just wanted to give you a slightly better sense of how we break out that formula PL and 5303 funding um, of the roughly six million that you see in the blue pie chart here. Um, that's documented in the UPWP. So next, to, next slide, please. So about close to 90% can be split pretty evenly into three sort of 30% buckets of funding for a couple of different planning areas that we carry out. So next slide, please. So first, about 1.6 million is invested in the ongoing support to the MPO board and its committees and developing the core federally required planning processes, which I've already mentioned at various points, which include our long range plan, transportation improvement program, and the, the unified planning work program, or UPWP. Next slide. Another 1.6 million is spent on advancing um, the MPO's goals through our programmatic work. Next slide. Um, we support a long list of programs, which I won't um, list all here, but they are in the areas of multimodal and modal specific programs, climate and resilience related programs, and then programs related to equity, engagement, and measuring the outcomes of the MPO's investments. Next slide, please. And the third bucket is about 1.5 million that's invested in computer resources, the managing of data and tools in, in support of our planning work. But the majority of the amount, about one million, goes towards developing and maintaining our most complex tool required for the long range planning process, which is the travel demand model. Next slide. And finally, over 10% um, or close to 700 million, uh, 700,000 of the PL and 5303 funding in federal fiscal year 2024 was allocated to a series of investments that are sort of more directly responsive to stated, to stated needs and requests from our stakeholders. These include federally uh, MPO funded technical assistance work for cities, towns, and transit agencies. Um, it includes 5303 funds channeled through Mass DOT in support of transit projects, primarily in support of MBTA study needs. And some of this funding is also invested in cross-cutting studies that are managed at least for this year in outside of the programmatic areas that are the core parts of our work. 
but they often have um, a really big impact as they can grow into a body of work that sort of transforms what we do at the MPO. So my first two spotlights are actually in that area of um, sort of individual discrete studies expanding out into larger bodies of work for our MPO. So next slide, please. So the five spotlights I'll share today are in the area of transportation finance, freight decarbonization, travel demand modeling, engagement, and safety. And they represent all compelling advancements that we've made in the MPO's work. They are only still a subset of what we do, but I think that the spotlights emphasize what we can accomplish with federal funds and further they will help highlight some of the work that we're going to be leaning into in federal fiscal year 2025. Next slide. So first, the MPO has been advancing foundational and innovative work in the area of transportation funding. In federal fiscal year 20, 2024, we completed an assessment of roadway pricing strategies across the country for lessons learned and potential relevance for the potential implication, the implementation in the Boston region. Also in federal fiscal year 2024, we were engaged by the MBTA to explore the application of funding strategies used by pure transit agencies across the country for their potential re re relevance in helping to increase revenue to support providing reliable transit service in the Boston region. And that study was called the MBTA Sources of Community Value. These two studies generated a lot of interest, especially in the context of the broader conversations happening in the Commonwealth around transportation funding and finance. And we packaged those findings into briefs and shared them on a resource page, um, a trending topics resource page, um, as a resource for anyone in the region interested in better exploring these sorts of opportunities. And then the MBTA Sources of Community Value Report, Community Value Report was shared with the Transportation Funding Task Force um, for their consideration as well. So we're looking forward to continuing this really important body of work um, alongside other agencies' work and the task force work itself. The MPO is investing in a follow-on study in federal fiscal year 2025 to, to explore the potential impacts of roadway pricing if implemented in the Boston region. And we're also advancing this type of research through our core programmatic work in equity, engagement, and data analysis. So we're looking forward on building on what we've learned here and bringing it into the long-range plan um, update, which we've just kicked off and is expected to be complete in about 2027. Next slide. So next, I'd like to highlight how we've launched a new area of mode-specific climate work, which is decarbonizing freight. Um, in federal fiscal year 2024, we completed our first study in this area called Sustainability and Decarbonizing in the Freight and Logistics Sector in the North Suffolk Area. And while we have an ongoing freight program with many initiatives associated with it, this particular research evolved from an idea that was shared by the city of Chelsea, which experiences challenges in, with freight movements related to safety, noise and air pollution, and resilience. And those challenges are also shared by nearby cities and towns around them. So the study included not only Chelsea, but Revere, Winthrop, East Boston, and Everett, south of Route 16. Now, of course, any challenges related to freight have to be explored in the context of the really essential role that freight plays in our quality of life and the economic vitality of the region. So we worked within that context to identify relevant, regionally relevant decarbonization strategies that would also be supportive um, of the important role of freight in our region. We looked at electrification and alternate, um, alternate fuels, um, air quality reporting, shifting modes, and improved coordination where that would be feasible. So what's next in this space? We'll continue to work on this as part of our freight program, and we'll begin to develop a regional freight decarbonization plan supplemented with an additionally funded federal fiscal year 2025 study exploring the potential for e-bikes for first and last mile freight connections in the Boston region. And this work is supporting the recently established federal goal to achieve a zero emission freight network by 20, 2040. My third highlight, next slide. Um, it's about the evolving use of data and tools at the MPO, and specifically the release of the MPO's newest travel demand model, also known as TDM23. This represents a new approach to the practice of travel demand modeling, not only in the Boston region, but also relative to the practice as a whole across the nation. We developed and released TDM23 as a publicly accessible resource with dynamic documentation that makes its structure transparent to users and the public. And to date, over 20 of our regional partners and members of the modeling community, including regional planning agencies, universities, and consultants, have requested a copy of and received TDM 23. The approach to being um, transparent and public in this release is that it gives us an unprecedented opportunity to work with our partners 
in the model development community to really improve the value of this resource as a tool in supporting decision making and working towards the transportation visions we have for our future in the region. So in addition to being accessible um, to the travel demand modeling community, TDM23 also has a user guide that provides great visualizations of model outputs to help those of us who are not experienced in software development to also be able to understand what information these tools can bring to the decision-making process. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and now and going forward, we are leveraging existing and new data sets and tools to further advance the state of the modeling practice by exploring how we can gain insights on the impacts of things like coastal flooding, new vehicle technology and, and services and transit reliability on transportation behavior. Also, the MPO is investing funding to develop another model, the FTA stops model, which will give us the ability to rapidly produce transit focused ridership estimates that will be really supportive in some of the regionally relevant projects that we are supporting with this tool. So we're also looking forward, looking forward to applying TDM23 in our next long range plan, which I already mentioned is kicked off and should be used in around, or completed in around 2023. And this travel demand model is a necessary part of developing the long range plan. So fourth, next slide please. I'd like to spotlight how we're continuing to enhance our ability to reach stakeholders in the region, particularly those with less input to date into the transportation planning process. We've been evolving the medium through which we share our work with the public to make it more accessible to people in the region. And in federal fiscal year 2024, we received international recognition in a competition for developing compelling place-based stories using the Story Maps platform. So our submission, which was among those from 50 countries, was the story map we produced for the study that the MPO supported to make recommendations to improve equitable access to the Blue Hills Reservation. But it's not enough to produce compelling materials. We're also piloting a new, or have piloted, a new way to, to, re, to include stakeholders that are traditionally less heard in the MPO process. So the pilot was for a community planning lab, which is a day-long, deep-dive civic and um, educational engagement tool for com community-based organizations to cultivate peer learning and empower them to effectively advocate for their community's transportation needs. Um, in the pilot, we engaged five previously unreached groups, which were compensated for their time in this process. And we're looking forward to continuing those labs and bringing more, um, less heard stakeholders into the planning process. And then we developed this concept really in partnership with members of the Regional Transportation Advisory Council. I really appreciate Andy um, being able to give some comments today on behalf of Len Diggins as the chair. And this is a group that's called for for the MPO's MOU to represent broad stakeholder interest into the MPO's planning processes. So the Advisory Council members supported us as staff in continuing to explore and implement best practices in diverse engagement and outreach um, through the MPO processes. And so now, as Andy mentioned, we are now designing and planning for a new structure for that group to further advance those goals. Um, Andy also kind of covered my talking points. We held a closing ceremony celebration with the current structure and members of the Advisory Council yesterday, really recognizing their contributions to this MPO, this board, and to the region, of which there were many, many contributions they have made over the years. And I'd like to share my personal gratitude to Len Diggins, who's chaired this group for five years and represents them on this board. And he will continue um, to serve on this board during the transition period, and so he will continue to benefit from Len's participation until that transition is complete. So my final, next slide. My final um, federal fiscal year 2024 planning um, spotlight today relates to the unprecedented opportunity we have had in the last year as an MPO to advance safety as an umbrella for all of our work. And thank you to Administrator Singh to already calling out the success that we have had in being awarded almost $10 million through the two federal Safe Streets and Roads for All grants that we applied for and were able to secure. And with that funding, we will be able to make ambitious progress towards the MPO Board's commitment to achieving zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries in the region. The, the SS4A funding supports us in establishing our first region-wide Vision Zero Action Plan and then continue to test the implementation of that plan through demonstration projects in specific cities and towns. And we're really looking forward to continuing to work with all of you and the Vision Zero Task Force on this work. Um, in December 2025, we expect to have that action plan in place and we'll be continuing advancing the plan and demonstration grants through federal fiscal year 2028. Next slide, please. 
So just to close, um, I hope these spotlights have helped illuminate what we can accomplish using a unique collaborative regional framework to advance transportation vision for our future. Through the planning work, such as I highlighted today and much more that I'm not able to talk about today, we really have the ability to demonstrate the power and impact that the MPO as a federally funded regional organization can have in leveraging dollars and resources to implement change. So again, thank you for your role in all of that and support to staff in this work. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd happy to pass the meeting back to you. Thank you, Tegan. Questions for Tegan? Hey, Tegan, I just have a quick one yeah. before you leave. So the SS4A demonstration grants. Are, do you have selected communities? Are you waiting till the planning grant is done to select communities? Like how are you actually determining who, where you will put the demonstration grants? Um, I was gonna ask if my expert in this grant process could give him very she, accurate. She's up next, I can, to, I she's can, up next anyway. It's I know, perfect. it's a good point. I can generally respond, but I think she will give you the most accurate as to where we stand with our coordination. Sure, with and, 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 and uh, yeah, I'm just interested. It's not a gotcha question. No, at no, all, okay? absolutely. No, I just, yeah. Rebecca. Happy, yeah, happy to, to respond. Um, so it's a bit of a mix. Um, as part of the application, we did reach out to cities and towns in the region and talked about projects that we've already been thinking about that fit within the general structure that we're developing as part of the action plan and also We've done a robust uh, safety analysis that identified where there's high risk locations. And so we're going to use that data to also identify other locations to do these implementations. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yeah. Julia. I had a quick question. Oh, sorry. Quick question about the TDM 23. We, maybe I missed that in, in what you said, but is it, was it developed in 2023? I heard you say, like, oh, we have sorry. these goals by 2023. And, I was a little confused. So the, the model name is TDM 23. Yeah. It's based on you know base years and, and years that are used in the modeling process. So this was released within the last federal fiscal year fully publicly. Uh -huh. I don't have the exact month in mind. I feel like I should because there was a lot <laughs> leading up to that release. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it was re it's been developed for a couple of years and released just in this past federal fiscal year. In 2023 still. Yes, federal so. fiscal year 2024. Okay. But in calendar year 2023, okay. I believe, which is within the federal fiscal year. It was going to bother me Not later in the day. Like, yeah. yeah. If you want to talk about the state fiscal year too, we can do that. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Tegan. Thank you very much. Oh, wait. I'm yeah. sorry. Wait. Sorry. Wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jen. Jen has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not so much a question as a, just a, a note of how significant this body of work is and um, impressive that everything's that's been accomplished in the past year. And I just wanted to really commend Tegan and MPO staff for like not only doing the things that we need to as a board meet and to keep all of the, the processes that um, kind of are entrusted to us going, but also tackling issues like um, roadway pricing, like decarbonizing freight, um, safety and vision zero, like these are, um, you know, since I served on staff, like the capabilities that the staff has grown and in, um, in kind of choosing these areas that are of interest and um, that we as municipalities really need, you know, some kind of regional perspective brought to is um, incredible. So. Thank you. Many thanks, Jen. And I am, of course, only speaking for the many, as I mentioned, talented staff, that many of whom are in the room who have been engaging in this work. So thank you for that recognition. Thank you, Tegan. Next up is the Boston Region MPO Grant Strategy and Highlights, Rebecca Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca Morgan, the Director of Projects and Partnerships with the Boston Region MPO staff. And I'm grateful to be here this morning to talk to you about the regional grant strategy that uh, we've been working on over the last couple of years, as well as highlighting a couple of projects that we are undertaking as part of those grants. Next slide, please. And can you switch to the next slide, please? The bipartisan infrastructure law uh, established by the Biden-Harris administration is a once-in-a-generation uh, funding opportunity. Um, with $550 billion um, being uh, $550 billion being um, available for discretionary funds over a five-year period, um, it's been uh, unprecedented. And this board has decided to uh, pursue these federal funds as well as other funds through state grants as well. Next slide, please. And as we're thinking about which grants uh, to apply for, I really have to think about that within the Long Range Transportation Plan framework, which is a 20-year vision, and the goals that have been laid out and agreed upon within that vision. And so in the slide, I've included those six goals, and I'm going to run through them briefly because they are very significant for decisions we've made around which grants to pursue. 
Um, so firstly, equity, transportation, planning process, and making investments that eliminate transportation-related disparities in disadvantaged communities. Safety, achieving zero fatalities and serious injuries within the region. Mobility and reliability, supporting reliable movement of both people and goods. Access and connectivity, access to key destinations to support economic vitality and high quality of life. Resiliency, um, providing um, both transportation uh, solutions as well as enabling people to respond to and to adapt to climate change. And clean air and uh, healthy communities, freeing us from greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutants. Next slide, please. In addition to these goal areas um, and making sure that, you know, the projects that we go for, are they really going to move the needle? Are they going to move us toward those goals? We also have other guiding principles that we use in selecting grants. One is, you know, will this project address a regional or local need? Um, another is, will it fill a gap or remove a barrier in really building a sustainable multimodal transportation system? Will it lead to further projects and increase funding opportunities for the region? And is it doable? Is it something that we can work on together? Next slide, please. So that's the kind of guiding principles, but now in terms of which projects are we pursuing, as an MPO, we're taking a regional approach. Um, and so we're really investing in developing these regional frameworks and doing those in a way that's going to really support local level needs. Um, so if you see the slide here, um, thinking about action plans, for example, the Vision Zero Action Plan, which is a, a grant that we're working on now to develop a regional action plan for the region around safety that's identifying projects and strategies as well as funding solutions to move us towards that goal. We're also uh, developing regional data sets that will be accessible and open to cities and towns for their use, and then supplementing that with toolkits and other resources like guidebooks to give information on how to access those tools and that information to best support cities and towns. And lastly, um, working on pilot projects and implementing those pilots, um, investing in those, and then testing with before and after analysis to determine, was this pilot indeed successful? And if it is, then scale that pilot at a regional scale, and then feed that pilot information back into the regional framework that's been developed. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to say quickly, we've applied um, so far for six grants. We've been successful so far for four of those grants, and those are the ones on the, light, the left in the light blue. Two of the grants we're still waiting on. They're under review currently, and those are the two that are on the right, with highlighted in a, in a darker blue color. Today, I'm going to focus on uh, two primary, primary areas. One, the SS4A, Safe Streets and Roads for All grants, and the other is the MVP grant, which is really focused around heat resilience and active transportation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with the MVP uh, no project, which we're calling No Heat. Um, we were awarded $1.1 million for this work. Before I jump into what this project is about, you may be asking, like, why are we investing in heat um, as, a, as an MPO? Uh, as you know, we had a pretty hot summer. Um, Mayor Wu had declared a heat emergency in mid-July for three days, and then I think again in early August, a three-day heat advisory. We're seeing temperatures on the rise in the Boston region. We're also seeing that same uh, challenge nationally. Um, one thing to, to note is that uh, extreme heat is actually referred to as the silent killer because it is the leading cause of weather-related fatalities in the United States. We know that during heat waves, people walking and biking and rolling are ex really experiencing the highest risk uh, around heat. Um, and in addition to health risks, there is also a challenge with access. My colleague, Ronak Basu, had worked on a study, and uh, one of those findings, the major findings, was transit accessibility actually reduces due to heat, that the perceived distance that someone has from where they are to a transit stop actually increases as heat rises. So that's kind of just some context of why we uh, decided to pursue this study, and so just a little bit on, on what we're doing. Um, this study uh, will be creating data sets at the regional scale that will might bring together both mobility data as well as heat data. Um, and as part of that, it's going to be available for the entire MPO, and there'll be locations that are identified that say these are the high-risk locations where people are walking and biking and ex also exposed to the greatest heat. Um, we're partnered with Mass Bike and Walk Mass, uh, Bike to the Sea, who are advocates that are going to be working with us to ground truth that data through walk audits and bike audits. And then we're partnering with cities and towns to do some implementation of mitigation strategies. Um, and then we'll feed all of what we find back into this regional data set. Next slide, please. 
The second area that I'd like to highlight is the Safe Streets and Roads for All grants, the first being a Vision Zero Action Plan, which is currently underway with the amount of $2.7 million. Um, over 1,000 people on our roadways are killed or seriously injured uh, each year. Um, roadway crashes are actually one of the leading causes of death of children under the age of 18 in the Commonwealth. During uh, the Map Free Road Safety Summit, which may, maybe some of you had attended, David Mooney, the trauma medical director of Boston Children's Hospital, shared that for every child fatality, there are 40 more children admitted to the hospital and 1,000 more go to the ER. This board um, agrees that a single death or serious injury is really an issue and it's unacceptable. And so it's why we you know, have this Vision Zero goal and also why we pursued these two grant applications and were successful. Um, the first uh, grant that I mentioned is the v Vision Zero Action Plan. And in that action plan, we're developing a regional framework and roadmap to safer streets. And this will be real actionable steps that are developed. And those actionable steps, actionable steps will include policy recommendations as well as projects. And they'll be kind of focused on the safe system approach. So first, safe roads and safe streets. Um, we know that speed is what kills, but simply reducing the speed limit and increasing enforcement isn't gonna solve the problem. You really have to look at road design and these roads need to be self-enforcing where the street design itself um, forces drivers to slow down. Another major component of this is safe vehicles. Um, and in the US, we know that vehicles are getting larger, they're getting heavier, and with those increases, it's becoming more and more difficult to see people walking and biking. With the weight increase as well, it's, people can be going slower, drivers can be going slower, and they're still resulting in fatalities and serious injuries. Um, nationally, about one-fourth of truck-involved vehicle road user uh, sorry, vulnerable road user fatalities occurred at low driving speeds involving trucks with poor direct vision. And MassDOT is working in this area, um, and the MPO in coordination with cities and towns can really be working with MassDOT on implementing some of the findings from that work. The action plan will also identify timeframes um, as well as uh, funding requirements um, and the responsible entities for each of the actions that are identified. Next slide, please. This past September, we were also awarded um, another uh, Safe Streets and Roads for All grant. The total project amount with MATCH is $9.3 million. And in this grant, which has already been mentioned, we're going to be doing demonstration projects uh, across the region and testing those implementations and providing what we learned through those pilot implementations back into the regional framework. These solutions are going to be implemented across the region. We're going to be looking to partner with cities and towns um, to implement different traffic traffic calming strategies and see how they are both accepted and how they perform in certain and different urban and suburban settings. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, collaboration is absolutely essential for these efforts. Um, you know, for as owners of roads and infrastructure, we really need to work closely with you as we implement these pilots. And so we we're looking forward to that further collaboration as we work towards solutions um, for problems that we know are life-threatening. Um, so really looking forward to that. Also, these grants have given us opportunity to really move faster toward our regional goals, but making kind of facts or progress here um, in goals like climate resilience and safety are really going to require us, require us to work together toward getting public and political buy-in, which is really needed in order to implement these changes. Um, and also with the development of data tools and resources, we also need your support to understand what is it that you need. And so whatever we develop in terms of those resources will actually be useful for you. And lastly, um, um, and all the projects that I just mentioned, all the grant opportunities, and everything that Tegan had mentioned before me in her presentation are all together building within the regional framework toward reaching our goals, um, establishing a strong pipeline toward capital and construction projects that can really bring change on the ground. Um, with that, I will pass it back to you, Mr. Chair, for any comments and questions. Thank you. Any questions for Rebecca? Lindsay? Uh, 
Uh, Rebecca, thank you so very much. Um, I, I wanted to comment in particular on, I'm thrilled to hear all of those updates, but if I can lean into one of them, and that's the issue of heat. Um, I, I want to call out that the, uh, for the awareness of all, all of the members here today, the MBTA released a climate assessment just a couple of weeks ago where we are looking internally at all of the work that we need to do to be able to respond to the changing conditions and the idea that you are trying to sort of look at the, some of the data science and where do we, where do we need to be focusing our energies. I'd love to make sure there's some alignment there. We know that greater than 60% of the people who take transit walk to transit, and if it is hot, and they often stand in the sun to wait for transit. Uh, and so uh, how do we think about um, our future development and those, and, and then internally, how does that relate to staffing plans that we might need to have if we have a lot of heat stress for our staff? How do, how do we think about that? How does that impact potential service? And so I think we're at a really great place to bring some, some tighter alignment between the work that you're doing so that those data outcomes can inform some, some work that we're doing. So I wanted to both bring awareness for everybody that that's important work that we're doing, but uh, would welcome some, um, some and really would offer up some of my staff to kind of be, be thought partners with you um, so that that output can really be, be put to use next summer, uh, frankly. <laughs> so thank you. Any other questions or comments? Matt? Uh, hey, Rebecca, um, just wanted to uh, say, first off, thank you for your partnership. Uh, you know, really appreciate working with you over, um, you know, on these grants and sort of uh, going forward. Hope to do some more of that. Uh, but I'll just echo what, what Lindsay says as well. Love to partner with you and think through this heat resiliency point. Heat resiliency is something that Mayor Wu has been, um, uh, you know, prioritizing and trying to think through how we can um, enhance our city in terms of having a more resilient and equitable um, sort of planning around this. And I'll say, in terms of bus stops in particular, Boston has nearly 2,000 bus stops. We only have shelters at 300. So thinking through that heat resiliency point, you know, maybe you get shade from a tree, maybe you get shade from a building, but so many of these people are waiting at bus stops without shelters or without any type of heat uh, cover. So, you know, love to partner with you and think through that a little bit more. Thank you, Matt. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Rebecca, very much. Next item on the agenda is the Boston Region MPO Capital Investment Impacts. Ethan LaPointe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good, I think we're still in morning. Good morning, everybody. My name's Ethan LaPointe. I'm the Transportation Improvement Program Manager with the MPO. And as my colleague, uh, Rebecca Morgan, just closed with, I'm here today to talk about some of the capital projects and ongoing opportunities that municipalities have to leverage federal funding through the Transportation Improvement Program with the MPO. If we can go on to the next slide, as part of this presentation, I'm going to be highlighting the benefits of some of the investments that the MPO has made in recent years, and by some, what I'm really referring to is a very select few specific locations that help to illustrate some of the region-wide work we've been conducting. You heard earlier from the Highway Administrator as to the breadth of all projects that are happening, not only in the Commonwealth, but also at a smaller scale within the region. This is a very small subsection of that. So if we can go on to the next slide, what this presentation is really going to kind of focus on are three key areas. One, where has the MPO undertaken investments in your communities with regard to complete streets projects, but also targeted intersection improvement projects? Two, how are the investments that the MPO makes that this body votes on consistent with and how do they advance the MPO's vision, goals, and objectives? And most importantly for everybody in this room, what are the kinds of benefits that these projects have delivered for your communities and also the greater Boston region? So with that, if we can go on to the next slide. What this map here on screen shows is a subsection of projects across the Boston region that have been completed or will be completed based on anticipated readiness dates falling within October 2023 and November 2025. These are all MPO-funded regional target projects, and this helps to illustrate the amount of impact and benefits that can be delivered by leveraging transportation improvement program funding. Each of these investments, as we go on to the next slide, are meant to work towards our long-range transportation plan goals that really outline and set the foundation for the TIP, and also help to ensure that they can deliver these kinds of outcomes to see what we would want in the Boston region. These, for this presentation at least, are the outcomes of improving safety, enhancing access to transit, improving uh, transportation equity, constructing projects that are supportive of new housing developments, and also, most importantly, connecting the transportation system where projects that are being implemented or will be implemented are attached to and connecting and complementing each other. 
as we can go on to the next slide, we can look at the first of these conditions, which is the safety category, the goal for which is to eliminate fatalities, injuries, and any incidents of safety uh, or safety incidents that are experienced by those who use any kind of transportation mode. To help highlight this, if we can go on to the next slide, there's an image that we have here that helps to show how many of the different kinds of targeted safety projects that the MPO undertakes begin on corridors that may lack any kinds of quality or really any infrastructure for individuals to safely walk or bike to get to the destinations they need to go to. For example, if we can go on to the next slide, we can look at a recently completed project in Natick along Route 27, where the existing uh, corridor, as it spanned from Wayland's Kachichuit village to the north down to Sherburne to the south, was largely devoid of good condition sidewalks, which were often absent of curbing. And this was also despite the fact that many individuals on this corridor may rely on being able to walk to destinations to use the bus 10 and bus 11 services provided by the Metro West Regional Transit Authority. These were also issues, as you can see on the right, that were addressed when the project was funded through the MPO that helped to do things like relocate utility poles and also mitigate vegetative overgrowth. And also, of course, improve the state of good repair of the roadway and enhancing that connection. We can also stick with this native project a little bit as we move on to the next slide with the next goal area, looking at access to transit and improving ways that people can get to transit facilities, be they rail or bus or other modes, through a variety of different non-single occupancy vehicle transportation modes to alleviate congestion. So in Natick, if we can go on to the next slide, 61% of all passengers that uh, to the Natick Center station would walk to their train. There are about 10,000 residents within one mile of that station, lending itself to a sort of housing density that is highly supportive of this kind of transportation improvement, but also indicative of the fact that this project was critical in resolving a major last mile gap to ensure safe access to Natick Center. It's important to note that by having safe facilities, this helps to mitigate a self-reinforcing effect where when more people are compelled to drive to a station, that can create an environment on the roadway that is hostile to pedestrians, further discouraging people from walking to these stations, further encouraging people from driving to these kinds of key destinations. By providing more transportation choices in commuter rail neighborhoods, like these, we can ensure a safe and accessible means of reaching all transit hubs outside of cars. But this is also especially critical in areas where households may struggle to afford a car. This is evidence as we go on to the next slide through our equity uh, spotlight area, which is the focus on investing in transportation options in disadvantaged communities to fully meet all residential transportation needs. Here we can shift our focus a little bit on the next slide by looking at the conditions of two projects in Everett and Chelsea, one on Broadway in Chelsea and one on Ferry Street in Everett, both of which ran entirely through environmental justice neighborhoods. These are also corridors that support three MBTA bus routes that through the bus network redesign effort would all be slated to be high frequency routes. These routes, if we can go on to the next slide, are the 104, 110, and 116, and 85% of the riders of the 104 and 116 hail from low-income households. It's also important to note that post-COVID, these routes have retained 93% of their pre-COVID ridership. As we go on to the next slide, it's important to note in looking at these projects, or really all projects that we would consider near bus stops, that the vast majority of individuals walking to their, or going, trying to take a bus are walking to that bus stop. But it's also important to note that this is hazardous. Recent analyses, studies, and efforts from MassDOT have indicated that in the Boston area, 50% of all accidents involving a pedestrian have occurred within 300 feet of a bus stop. But these areas only reflect about 16% of all of our roadways in the region. This reinforces the kinds of needs for projects that install curb bump outs to slow down vehicles that are approaching pedestrian crossings, uh, improve daylighting measures that help to prioritize a focus on individuals at these crossings rather than solely visibility for those who are within cars, and also protected bicycle lanes at main intersections. It's also important to note that this is not only a critical investment for those who are currently using transit services, but those who would do so with enhanced service. And this is illustrated in part by another project elsewhere on the next slide within the community of Newton. In Newton, Needham Street, or I'm sorry, this helps to address our proximity to new development category. If we can go forward again, please. Uh, on to the next slide, thank you. Uh, to help improve multimodal access to jobs, affordable housing, and essential services, as highlighted on the next slide, through the city of Newton with a Needham Street corridor project that was recently funded. 
Needham Street serves a critical retail and commuter corridor with several key crossings over both Interstate 95 and the Charles River. Through the Newton Northland development, which is shown on screen here, there's pro the proposed influx of about 800 new housing units. And as we go on to the next slide, this has raised some concerns from residents about what the impact these new housing units could have on what was already a congested corridor. It's worth noting that there was already transit service here that would have connected this development using MBTA bus service to the Green Line and the commuter rail. However, the limited pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure to help make that final last mile connection was potentially discouraging to the use of those alternative mo modes. As we go on to the next slide, one of the really key goals of the Highland and Needham Street corridor project was in delivering complete street projects in anticipation of that new development to help challenge the idea that new developments means more congestion by providing that space for alternative modes that can alleviate congestion. It's also important, sticking here on this corridor as we go on to the next slide, to highlight how connections between previous and upcoming projects help to close different gaps in our transportation network for seamless travel. As we go on to the next slide, it's important to know that the MPO does not consider projects in isolation and prioritizes ones that connect to completed projects that could be built in the future. It's also important to recognize that residents are rarely making trips that end at the borders of their communities. Let's start by looking at a project which is a little bit difficult to see here on screen, but it's in black, and it's a 2014 MPO-funded bridge replacement project which helped to provide crossings over both the Charles River and Interstate 95. This project predated the Highland Avenue and Needham Street project we just discussed, but it really provided this initial cornerstone of protected bicycle lanes and refurbished sidewalks, which were then extended on the next slide when the Highland Avenue and Needham Street project was completed. It's also worth noting on the next slide that there is a third project, which is working through the design process and now seeking construction funding through the next TIP for federal fiscal years 2026 to 2030. This project would seek to extend these connections further into, into downtown Needham to their commuter rail stations and also then create a seamless avenue for folks to walk, bike, or roll through the different commuter rail stations up over Interstate 95 in the Charles and all the way into downtown Needham. It's worth noting as well, while we're also on the next slide, we've mostly been discussing complete streets, intersection improvements, and roadway projects, that there's other ways to provide this connectivity as well. The Bruce Freeman Rail Trail is exemplary of this, not only within the Boston region, but the fact that it extends beyond it, starting in Lowell in initial phases in 2009. And with each subsequent section of this trail that's been reinforced, thanks to the efforts of local municipalities, MassDOT, the Department of Conservation, and of course the MPO, this trail has improved in value and its overall connectivity benefits across these municipalities. It's also worth noting that this trail is not complete. There's still work to be done, and the third phase of Sudbury's construction, which will conclude the trail in Sudbury, was funded through last year's TIP. In addition, the initial stages of Framingham Zone Extension were also funded through this past year's TIP on the statewide highway side. In conclusion, as we can go on to the next slide, it's worth noting again that everything I've talked about here today is just a snapshot of what gets done with MPO funding. As part of our Quick Builds program, or Community Connections, the TIP can fund small-scale projects such as bicycle rack procurements and also the expansion and sustainment of our regional Blue Bikes bike share system. The MPO also funds transit projects from commuter rail stations in Lynn to uh, station-wide accessibility improvements at Jackson Square on the MBTA's Orange Line and also enhancing capital improvements for our regional transit authorities, be they facilities or new fleet procurements as well. We're also not only looking at developing a transportation system that meets today's needs or even those of the housing needs of the next decade, but also building a transportation network that is resilient to long-term extreme weather events. Our upcoming improvements, as illustrated on the next slide, are going to deliver not only key transit improvements in Boston, but also complete streets in Watertown and Littleton, improved regional trails and walkways from the Mystic River to the North Shore, and with even more projects to come. Today, there are 69 projects in the federal fiscal years 2025 to 29 TIP, the current one effective today, and as we're looking for the projects for the next one, we want to grow that number. As this body on the next slide is very involved in working to solicit those projects, we'll also continue to support that connection between the TIP, the short-range capital plan, and our long-range transportation plan by supporting funding to re-envision Rutherford Avenue in Boston, reconfigure, redesign, and reconnect neighborhoods along McGrath Highway in Somerville, but also now supporting design funding to provide initial funding that is currently set aside in 2026 
for the design of the grade separation for Route 126 and 135 near Framingham's commuter rail station, and also design funds for the Route 4 225 interchange project in Lexington near Route 128. It's also worth noting that the town of Lexington has been advancing design funds, or has been advancing a design to construct the Hartwell Avenue, Bedford, and Wood Street sections of this project separately, and the Hartwell Avenue and Bedford section in Lexington may also seek construction funding in this year's upcoming TIP cycle. So with that, if we can go on to the next slide, if you and your communities have a transportation project that you would want to see done, be it signs and wayfinding elements, uh, bike lane lines, and project designs, all the way up to major transformative projects for main streets, applications are already open today for the next TIP. If you can, uh, would like to learn more, you can always contact myself, Ethan LaPointe, but I also want to give credit here as well to Adriana Jacobson, our capital programming planner, who did the lion's share of the research to get this presentation together today. So with that, I'm happy to field any questions. Thank you, Ethan. Questions for Ethan? Seeing none, thank you, Ethan, very much. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of September 19th. Can I get a motion in a second? And please state your name for the record. Tom O'Rourke. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of September 19th. Thank you. Is there a second? Jean Rowe. I will second that motion. Motion have been made and second. Any comments, changes, questions, or suggestions? Seeing none, please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. John Bouchard. <laughs> John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Lindsay Heffernan. Lindsay Heffernan, yes. Sarah Lee? Yes. Julia Wallers? Julia Wallers, yes. Anna Switlikowski? Um, Anna Switlikowski, yes. <laughs> uh, Matt, Matt Moran? Matt Moran, yes. Jen Rowe? Jen Rowe, yes. Eric Molinari? Eric Molinari, yes. Uh, Ned Codd? Ned Codd, yes. John Alessi. John Alessi, yes. Aaron uh, Bernard Green. Bernard Green, I have to abstain. Do we have Tom Bent? Tom Bent, yes. Kristen Guichard. Kristen Guichard, yes. Dennis Giambetti. Dennis Giambetti, yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn, yes. Melissa Tentopoulos. Erwin Nassoff. I don't know if Erwin's still on the Zoom, but Chris Diorio, yes. Thank you. Rachel Benson. Rachel Benson, abstain. Abstain. Tom O'Rourke. Yes. And Jimny. Jimny, abstain. Abstain. Thank you, and that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, David. Next time on the agenda is the appointment of committee slates. With your indulgence, I'm going to read them to you and then we'll take a motion for all of them just to approve their, the slates. On the UPW committee, MassDOT will maintain the chair. It will be also the city of Boston, the Intercore Community Somerville, MAPC, the MBTA Advisory Board, Metro West Framingham, Newton, the Advisory Council, TRIC, and Rentham. On the ANF committee, it is the MBTA Advisory Board is the chair, City of Boston, MAPC, MassDOT, Framingham, and the Advisory Council. On the Congestion Management Committee, it is the City of Everett is the chair, City of Boston, MassDOT, Massport, MBTA Advisory Board, the RTEC, the Town of Arlington, and TRIC. And on the TIP Process Readiness and Engagement Committee, which we colloquially refer to as TIPPER, it is the City of Boston is the chair, Somerville, MAPC, MassDOT, MassDOT seat number two, Acton, Framingham, the Advisory Council, Arlington, Brookline, and our newest member, the MWRTA. So can I get a motion and a second to approve? Well, first let me ask, is there anybody who wants to serve on a committee that was not mentioned who would like to be added to a committee? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to approve that new slate? Please state your name for the record. Dennis so move Dennis Schiambetti. Is there a second? I'll um, second that motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Please call the roll. Uh, David Muller. Yes. John Bichard. 
John Bichard, yes. John Romano? John Romano, yes. Lindsay Heffernan? Yes. Sarah Lee? Yes. Julia Wallers? Yes. Anna Switlikowski? Yes. Matt Moran? Yes. Jen Rowe? Yes. Eric Molinari? Yes. Ned Codd? Yes. John Alessi? Yes. Bernard Green? Yes. Tom Bent? Yes. Kristen Guichard? Yes. Dennis Giambetti? Dennis Giambetti, yes. Darlene Nguyen? Yes. Uh, Christy Orio? Yes. Rachel Benson? Yes. Tom O'Rourke? Yes. Jim Nee? Yes. Uh, Melissa Tintoklas? And is there anyone else I have not called? With that, motion carries. Thank you, David. Next item on the agenda are member items. Are there any items from any members today? Dennis? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick, um, uh, maybe raising a red flag. It seems to be a, um, a growing number of um, projects that are not meeting their target completion dates. It seems to be getting a lot of concerns from residents complaining about the delays in some of the projects. So I just wanted to raise that red flag. I don't know if it's a perceived issue or if it's a real issue, um, but there's a number of projects I know in the Metro West and in, in other areas that just seems to be taking a lot longer uh, to complete. I don't know, Mike, but I guess the concern is that we're ramping up now more and more projects. Um, is that gonna be something that we're gonna be seeing more and more of? And not only is it just, um, single projects, but some of the more complex projects, some of the sub-projects within those bigger projects seems to be taking along some of the bridge work and so forth that are part of the larger projects. Anyway, just to raise the red flag, we're gonna take a look at that and maybe see how we can maybe accommodate that. Uh, just a question, Dennis. When you say completion dates, are you saying projects that are in construction completion yes. dates? Yeah, so they're in, they're in construction. They, they had an initial target uh, completion date, and those dates are being missed for, you know, whatever reason there are, but I'm sure there's a handful of, of, of reasons that are causing those, but that seems to be, and you know, residents are concerned because they expect a certain completion date and, and those projects tend to be disruptive uh, to the uh, neighborhood and to the, to the drivers, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Tom Bent. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Tegan, and the staff for putting together another uh, really well won uh, annual meeting. Uh, very informative, uh, uh, and I just, I know the effort that gets put into putting this together, so I uh, just wanted to thank everyone. Thank you, Tom. It is 99.9% it is .9 down to staff. They, they do a great job. They do a great job all the time, but but yes, this is this is a. <laughs> I'm sure Tegan could tell you over a beer sometime the the horror stories of getting this all done, but yes, <laughs> it's it. it's I 100% second that. Staff did a great job. Thank you so much. Any other? <laughs> any other member items at this time? May I add? Of course, you may add anything you want, Tegan. Not to be a killjoy um, after spending this great time together today, but we do also have another MPO meeting scheduled for next week. So I just wanted to call that out because we were off schedule in terms of trying to schedule this meeting in collaboration with you know, Mass DOT, the secretary, et cetera, you all. So we will see you again, but virtually next week, please. We have lots of important things that we're covering over the next three meetings, including major project updates, launching the TIP, um, a long range plan update and other things. So. Thank you for your time, and I will look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Jane. And now I will take a motion and a second to adjourn, and please state your name for the record when making the motion. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, I'll make that motion to adjourn. Jan Rowe. I'll second that motion, and also just thank everyone for making it here in person. It really makes it uh, all worthwhile. It is wonderful. Motion has been made and seconded. Without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much, and thank you everyone who attended.